Good afternoon and welcome to Newport Beach. We are going to convene the January 28th, 2020 study session. Madam Clerk, roll call please. The record re will reflect that Councilmember Muldoon, I'm sure, is on his way right behind me. There you go, perfect. All right. Uh, item number one, clarification of items on the consent calendar. Council, do we have any clar requests for clarification? All right, seeing none. We'll move into item number two, the proclamation of Barbara Sloat for her years of volunteering at Oasis Senior Center. Ms. Sloat, why don't you come on forward? So what we'll do is we'll have you stand right next to the, to the microphone on the other side. Yep, thank you very much. I haven't done this before. No, nope. yeah, but you've done a lot of volunteering. Um, so uh, we'll have uh, Councilmember Dixon give a, a few remarks and then I'm going to read the proclamation and then uh, you'll have an opportunity to speak if you'd like to. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. You're welcome, Ms. Sloat. Thank you. For eight years, Barbara Sloat has devoted her volunteer hours at Oasis Senior Center to planning and implementing the annual special event fundraiser for the Friends of Oasis. And for six years, Barbara has volunteered to co-manage the gift shop at Oasis, which is an ongoing fundraising effort for the Friends of Oasis. And Barbara has served as a devoted Friends of Oasis board member for the past eight years serving on several committees in order to support the efforts of the Friends and the Oasis Senior Center. And whereas in 19, 2019, Barbara was selected to serve on the Orange County Senior Services Advisory Council. For the first time, we now have a resident of Newport Beach serving on that council, which oversees and advises on state-funded senior programs in the county. So now, on behalf of the mayor, Will O'Neill, Mayor of the City of Newport Beach, and on behalf of the entire Newport Beach City Council, we recognize Barbara Sloat for her tireless devotion and talent provided to the Oasis Senior Center and the City of Newport Beach. Thank you, Barbara. Let me just okay. uh, let me just explain um, why Barbara is being recognized. So we did get a request f uh, during the time I was mayor for a representative of the city who can represent the city on the county's human, what is it? It's called the member of the um, Senior Services Advisory Committee. And so I asked our OASIS staff and city staff uh, who is an outstanding volunteer in our OASIS community and Barbara's name was uh, unanimously identified. So thank you, Barbara, for all you're doing for our seniors in our community and for the county. And thank you, and welcome down. And do you want to come down too? Yeah, I, actually, before we do that though, um, Barbara, I just want to say thank you also for uh, all of the volunteer efforts that you've been doing for the city. Is there anything you'd like to say before we take a picture? <sighs> <laughs> well, I was very surprised and I feel very honored um, for the opportunity to serve. And I really feel very fortunate uh, to be able to give back to my community. Uh, it's kind of a family thing, my family, uh, that we've been doing it for three generations. Service to our community is really important. Uh, and my son is gonna be embarrassed, but he was honored last week, he's sitting here, by the Orange County Council of Boy Scouts of America for his service to scouting. So it's a family thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations. We're going to take a picture right over there. Thank you.
All right, and then for uh, my fellow council members, just so you know, we're going to be continuing item number SS3 to our February 25th meeting. And so with that, we're going to move into item number four, which is Newport Heights pedestrian and bicycle facility discussion. Um, before we start up the presentation, um, I'm going to uh, hand the mic over to Mayor Pro Tem, Brad Avery. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just so we're kind of understand how we're here uh, for this item tonight. Uh, I know all of you that have come for this item, uh, virtually all of you have attended the, um, our previous uh, efforts to bring the community together in the Heights and uh, discuss uh, Heights traffic and uh, pedestrian safety and um, trying to do things, uh, come up with some solutions to uh, make uh, our streets safer, which I know everybody wants to do, and, but everybody is not aligned and we have different opinions of how to get there and those meetings are sometimes tense. Um, and uh, so I felt, I feel the community has gone through quite a bit on this already. And some people asked me, well, why are we meeting again? And um, last year, I think it was in late summer, a community member brought uh, a group of folks here and the full council heard um, them speak and give some testimony as to their experiences with traffic in the Heights and their desire to see some things done to make uh, the area uh, more pedestrian, bike friendly, if you will, and safer. And so the council, um, I think, a number of the members were, um, all of us, of course, are concerned with that. And uh, so the council gave some direction to staff to perhaps look at the heights once again and uh, go and then conduct this uh, study session. So that's how we, we got here, just so you know. And uh, we're always open, of course, and we appreciate everybody coming in and we're always open to ideas. And we definitely want to hear from the community on this um, once again. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe adding just one other thing, because sometimes folks come to council meetings and wonder what uh, what a study session means versus a regular council meeting. Study session means we can't actually give direction. Uh, we can't take action, I should say, um, today. So if we were going to actually take action out of discussions we had today, that would have to come back to a future council meeting. That's the difference between a study session item, which is what this is, where we are get, trying to gather information and understand um, the issue versus uh, having it at our regular council meetings for for action all right we'll move on oh i'm sorry have we have we printed off enough copies yet okay so if you didn't get a copy and you would like a copy of the presentation it will be on the screen of course but we've got paper copies in the back all right mr webb thank you very much and good afternoon council um tonight we want to talk a little bit about as mr avery introduced uh, some more discussion in the newport heights area regarding pedestrians and bicycle movements so I'm also pleased to have with me tonight Brad Avery. He's our principal traffic engineer, civil engineer. I'm sorry, Brad Avery. That's Brad Avery. This is Brad Summers next to me. <laughs> so anyway, I'm going to turn it over to Brad to go through the uh, discussion. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, Mayor O'Neill and Mayor Pro Tem, Brad Avery. I am Brad Summers, <laughs> principal civil engineer within the Public Works Department. And as you both have mentioned, we will be talking about bicycle and pedestrian facilities and hopefully having a good discussion about that this afternoon. I think Mayor Pro Tem Avery went over uh, kind of the background on this uh, to highlight a few council items that have happened within the past few years. On August 14th, our city traffic engineer, Tony Bryan, who is with us here tonight, uh, did present the findings of the Newport Heights neighborhood uh, school traffic study. And throughout that and that extensive public reach out, for, out excuse me, effort, uh, 31 recommendations were created, of which, and we've noted that there were two, bike lanes on Clay Street as well as a loading zone on Beacon, were a bit controversial and the public spoke their part and we heard, and with that, City Council asked that the staff go back out to the community and have further, or have further conversation with them, which staff did do, and ultimately that led to the sheriffs we putting on Clay Street. Now it should be noted here that the consideration here was the concern of loss of parking on these streets. Now the conversation of course continued more in the background. We heard it in as staff members here at the city and then a public comment on October 8th of 2019, several members of the community more interested in adding bicycle and pedestrian facilities within this neighborhood 
spoke during the public comment period, which then led to council requesting an item to be placed on a future agenda, which here we are. So as the conversation continued, we really do hear two contrasting points of view and desires for this neighborhood. On one side, we're hearing from families, of course, of the school age children. There's a large school contingency within this neighborhood, but also other members within this neighborhood and community have a desire to add additional cycling and pedestrian facilities. On the other side, there's really a concern of losing street parking and the feel of urbanizing this neighborhood. Now, this is an older neighborhood, as we all know. It has some beautiful, mature landscaping. And we've heard from a lot of community members, I think many of which are with us here tonight, that have been part of this community for a long time, really like that neighborhood for what it is and how it is now. As far as the discussion tonight, we really look forward to having a forum and further council and community discussion. We do have some information or more information about different types of pedestrian and bicycle facilities that I feel is important to kind of have the conversation and understand what the potential benefits and impacts are. Uh, we've created some considerations to help that discussion along and if we choose to have uh, move forward with some of these items, maybe we can talk about some next steps. So this slide details quite a few items in addition to some larger items that have been done in this community. And when looking back through the studies we've had over the years and considering the amount of work that public work staff does, uh, again, in this neighborhood, we feel we actually pay quite a bit of attention to it. And, and that makes sense considering that it's an older neighborhood, it has a unique characteristic to it, and of course the influence of those three schools brings quite a bit of traffic in the morning and the afternoon. And earlier today, talking with our police department, they felt that they too, because of the nature again of this community and the schools, put quite a few resources, maybe more than you would see in other comparable size neighborhoods, uh, into this community in the morning. Looking at the Newport Heights area, we really pared it down from the full Newport Heights area to kind of the central area bound by Westminster on the west end, 15th Street on the north end, Irvine Avenue to the east, and Cliff Drive to the south, kind of as our focus area. Now, if we wish to discuss areas further out from this, that is, we are able to do that, but this is really where we're kind of focusing as we see most of the congestion and traffic. As we talk about pedestrian and bicycle facilities, it really comes down to the roadways, the users, what we have there, and then how we accommodate those different uses. Now, Newport Heights is actually fairly uniform. Most of the interior streets look a lot like Clay Street here with kind of the parking on both sides. You have enough roadway width for direction travel in both, or excuse me, for travel of motor vehicles in both directions. And of course, off the side, you can see the homes are set back a bit. We have this nice mature landscaping and some private improvements in the, uh, along the shoulder there. Um, but as we talk about these facilities and as we've heard more and more about what potentially could go into them, such as bike facilities, pedestrian facilities, it's important to look at this and understand how much room we have to work with, and that can lead us to the potential benefits or impacts. So in a way, in putting on kind of my public works goggles here, this is how we would look at the roadway, say, as we consider different facilities. When we take an interior street such as Clay, which is again a fairly typical street within the Heights, we have 36 feet of asphalt or 36 feet of a roadbed to work with. And that accommodates obviously the parking lanes, two-way vehicle traffic. And then if we have pedestrians or bicycles, they either share the road with the vehicle traffic or that interior area, or they may use the shoulder if cars aren't parked there. Now within this 36 feet, it's divided up into two 10-foot travel lanes, 10 feet for each direction of travel for a total of 20, two eight-foot parking lanes, so parking on both sides, and then a rather unique characteristic to Newport Heights, where we actually have 12 feet of unused public right-of-way on both sides behind the curb. Now, I'll flash back to the past slide. And again, you can see here, I guess unused may not be the right term, the, the landscaping and everything that has gone into this, mostly by the, the private residents or private parties, really does add to the character of that neighborhood. And we've heard that that is a concern of the residents as well. Talking about existing bicycle facilities, when you look at kind of the greater Newport Heights area, we show here the pink solid line, which is a continuous bike lane, say along Cliff Drive and up around Newport Harbor High. We have a dashed pink line here, which resembles a time-restricted or time-limited 
parking slash bike lane, and this is a unique facility that we put in, in these impacted areas where, say, heading towards Ensign Intermediate in the morning, parking would be restricted or prohibited from that southbound side, allowing the shoulder to be used by students as a bike lane. In the afternoon, parking is now allowed on that side of the street, but removed from the other side to allow students to leave along that bike lane. The light blue or cyan line here is actually the Sharrows that we've added onto Clay Street. Now again, we've heard quite a bit about bike facilities and pedestrian facilities, and I want to take the opportunity here to go through a few of them that I've heard about, really to talk about what these facilities are and really what the benefits and potential impacts to a neighborhood like the Heights could be if they were implemented. And we'll start with shared lane markings or sharrows. These are actually the green background sharrows shown in the picture here with some students leaving school in the afternoon. And the students are actually using this as intended. The sharrows, as we've implemented in a few places throughout the city, have shown an improvement in awareness, both for the cyclists using the roadway where they actually are intended to use the center of the road or share the lane where there's a parked vehicle such as the truck on the right. We've also seen the increase in awareness for the motorists. We feel that this is a good tool to remind motorists that there may be bicycles on the roadway. Now with Sharrows and how this was more or less a compromise for Clay Street as we move through the implementation of the school study, Sharrows do not require removal of parking and I think that was a benefit to many of the residents along Clay Street. And it should be noted as well is that the Bicycle Master Plan which was created or uh, completed in 2014 actually detailed Sharrows as an improvement within the Newport Heights neighborhood for a total of eight streets, including Clay Street. The next conversation item would be on-street bike lanes. These are fairly common. We generally see these on streets that act more like collectors or collectors or arterials, kind of your bigger, more high traffic streets. The picture here is actually showing Irvine Avenue where we have our time limited uh, parking versus bike lane. So this is leaving Ensign where these students are riding down the bike lane. And again, they're fairly common. I think we as users understand how we operate in these, whether we're motorists, we operate next to them, and bicyclists get their own path of travel, which is delineated generally by striping on the roadway. And more often than not, it's between the curb and the moving motor vehicles. Now, when considering implementation of something such as a bike lane within these interior streets in the Heights, the potential impact would be the removal of parking or restricted parking if we did what was the original recommendation from the study of doing that time limited parking on one side and then the other. Now protected bike lane also known as a separated bike lane uh, and as we show here is a one way there's a two way version of this called the cycle track two. We've heard quite about, a bit about this as well so we took a quick look at it. And the reality is these bike lanes are generally more for urban areas where, again, there's more traffic. Uh, you may have a sidewalk infrastructure in place for the pedestrians. And, and it really is a unique feature, but I'm not sure it's something that we would recommend for the interior streets of this neighborhood. As we have the slides up, the benefits to this where and if they could be implemented perhaps in another area is it does provide the cyclist with a path that is separated from the vehicles, whether it's parked vehicles or moving motor vehicles, through some sort of raised feature. In this picture, it shows kind of a raised concrete median. We've also seen delineators or some sort of other vertical element to allow the motorists to know that that is specifically for bikes. But one of the concerns with this, of course, is that they're not allowed for pedestrians or generally pedestrians are not intended uh, to use this facility. So therefore, again, they may or they are generally installed next to sidewalks. Just a moment, do you stay on that slide please, sure. Mr. Muldoon. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, it says not for pedestrians should have sidewalk. Is that a law? Um, no, these are fairly new. I don't know that there's legal ramifications to that or law written, but in all the guidance that we follow, they, these are intended for cyclists only. But so it's staff's opinion it should have a sidewalk. That's correct. We have seen some of these uh, go in, say, I want to say San Clemente or maybe further south, where they have allowed pedestrian access to them, but what they've done is they've added in an additional width for pedestrians, say an additional five feet, and then stripe that out completely separate. So it's essentially like having a sidewalk within the same area. Is there anything that requires us to have more than just simply a bike lane with a, bu a bumper? I, I'm not following. Is there anything in the law that requires us to have pedestrian access other than simply a bike lane with a curb buffer? No. Thank you. Okay. 
All right. Go ahead. Moving on to sidewalks and pedestrian facilities, again, looking at our overall map, what we show here is in the green or the bright green, we're actually existing and in continuous sidewalks, including the 15th Street sidewalk that was recently added to the south uh, shoulder of that roadway. Now, the pink areas are actually discontinuous sidewalks. These are areas where we may have had portions of sidewalk built through what we'll talk about next, a significant link policy, but they are discontinuous. So the blue lines represent our significant link streets. Now our predecessors uh, created what they call a significant link policy through municipal code section 1305.010 and the accompanying resolution 88-88, which determined that certain streets throughout the city would be considered significant links. And what this means is as these streets are redeveloped or the properties adjacent to them, the street would ultimately be put into its ultimate configuration. And in this neighborhood, Westminster, 15th Street, Irvine Avenue, and Cliff Drive were designated signif excuse me, significant streets, then leading to having sidewalks placed on them, but again, tied to redevelopment from the private property owner. Now, we had a great question regarding this from the public earlier this week, and what would trigger that? And following the municipal code section, the trigger for a homeowner or a private property owner along these links would either be redeveloping or, or redoing their house and adding up to 25% or, or more floor area space, or it would be considered new construction as determined by the Community Development Department. And again, if you were, say, a homeowner on Irvine Avenue, you completely leveled your home and were building a new home, at that point you'd be required to put a sidewalk segment in front of your home. The benefit to this is it does add sidewalks, and these streets will have sidewalks, but as we know, not everybody's redeveloping their homes at this point and or may not even have plans for that. So this could be kind of a long, gradual process and can lead to disjointed sidewalks. Just a moment, Ms. Dixon. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, Mr. <laughs> Summers, so just clarify that on the code requirement. Was that uh, created in 1988? I know the resolution being 1988, I believe that's when the resolution came in determining which streets. I'm not sure exactly when the code came in. Well, then uh, then my next question is, are we enforcing this in, de in private development that will require on a significant street that sidewalks are built? We do enforce this through our development area when homes come in for redevelopment or significant development. Examples of that would be 15th Street. We recently did a sidewalk project, as you know, but there were a lot of links in there that were already connected that we could build to. We did this on Irvine Avenue, too. There's several that the links are there. And then we did an augmentation program to basically connect those on the east side so of the we've street. So we've been enforcing this for we have been. many years. OK, thank you. Thank you. Looking at sidewalks, I think, again, this is a fairly common facility. and we, We've all used them, and I think we understand how they operate. But the benefit here is they do provide that path of travel away from moving motor vehicles. Within the city, per our municipal code section, we can actually designate them as bicycle sidewalks and have a dual use for them, both for pedestrians and cyclists. When considering the neighborhoods such as Newport Heights, they can be put in without a parking impact by reallocating some of the public right-of-way behind the curb. But of course, one of the downsides of this is we understand that reallocating that public right-of-way may remove some of those private improvements in landscaping, which of course leads into a lot of the residents' concerns of urbanizing the neighborhood. Now sidewalks could be put in in a few ways. On one end of the spectrum could be a large city project where they'd be put in in a quicker fashion. And then the, on the other end of the spectrum would be the significant link policy where it would determine these streets required or the sidewalks would be put in eventually. But again, that's through private redevelopment. Oh, sorry, just a moment, Mr. Muldoon. Thank you. What is the legal requirement for width of a sidewalk installed by the city or a private individual? Well, the basic legal requirement is usually ADA driven. So there's uh, like 42 inches or something. We can also dictate that through our standard plans that you approve. Some of ours are five feet, some are six feet, but there are areas in town like the peninsula we make exceptions there's, or Babwa Island, there's just not enough width for it. How, how wide is the one that was just pictured in your estimation? Six. I think that's an eight foot, Brad would say. Okay, thank you. 
So we also want to take an opportunity to look at Cliff Drive. Now, Cliff Drive is unique. It, it acts differently than our interior streets uh, simply because it connects the neighborhood down to Coast Highway and our coastal areas and is often used by motorists, pedestrians, and bicycles to access the neighborhood as well. So looking at the area, which actually starts as Riverside Avenue from Coast Highway, then turns into Cliff Drive, where Riverside turns north and heading to Irvine Avenue, we have a bit more room to work with. And one of the reasons why this is unique is actually instead of 36 feet, we actually have an additional 20 feet of roadway in this area. Now again, it, or it acts more like a local collector than an interior local street. And with that, we see more uses on this. So in this case, we actually have two 14-foot vehicle lanes. 14 feet is on the larger end of the spectrum. Generally, we're between 10 and 12 feet. We see that we have two bike lanes, one in each direction, six feet, accounting for each side. And then, of course, our parking lanes. Along the south side or the harbor side, we have a nice sidewalk facility that's a bit discontinuous. It starts about the Theater Arts Building and ends just short of Irvine Avenue. But then on the north side, the sidewalk is discontinuous and has kind of some mismatched segments. Like the other interior streets, we actually have the 12 feet of public right-of-way behind the curb. Focusing in on Cliff Drive a bit more, we wanted to look at the north side sidewalk. It actually starts on Riverside Avenue off the highway on the west side and then curves up and around. We have a nice 10-foot sidewalk here, which is utilized and very comfortable by both bicyclists and pedestrians. Once we cross past Riverside to Tusting, there is a missing link, and this is, this is something that we do see along these significant link streets. And in this case, people come off that sidewalk, and sometimes, as pictured here, some people choose to go against traffic through the segment. Continuing on from Tustin down to Irvine Avenue, again, here we have uh, several different styles of sidewalk, different widths, such as in the top corner here, this is about three feet. Down in the bottom left corner, we have a five foot section of side sidewalk that was recently put in as part of the significant link policy through the construction of a new home. And then there are several segments that are actually missing. Just a moment, Mr. Avery. Brad, I'm sure you looked at this about um, perhaps shrinking the lanes I am certainly no traffic engineer, so 11 feet or even the minimum 10 feet, and then yielding the sidewalks without encroaching into all the hardscape and softscape residents have put, a, put in over the years? Yes, that's a consideration. Actually, we, can, we have a detail on that a little bit later in the presentation. So as the Public Works Department helped facilitate the discussion, we put together some considerations. Uh, one note here is, is we do not have bicycle lanes or bike facilities specifically called out in these considerations. And with that, it really came back to the discussion of we know parking is very important for this neighborhood, and that's something that we've heard over and over again from the community. And also, like the protected bike paths, bicycle lanes generally aren't for pedestrian activity. Now, they, pedestrians can walk in them if there's no sidewalk adjacent to them for a standard bike lane. But in the case of, say, a sidewalks, again, we can make it a du dual-use facility. So we've been, and it wouldn't have that parking impact. So the considerations for discussion are not limited. Are, we're not excluding the talk about bicycle lanes, but the, the considerations lean more towards the pedestrian facilities. So the first consideration, additional significant link streets, to help fill in the, or the, the sidewalk and network within the neighborhood there, again, within that central area, the consideration here is to designate Clay, Tustin, and Beacon as significant links. Again, this is done to help facilitate that network within the neighborhood, and it's actually, I'd like to reiterate, we've heard, obviously, the school traffic use, utilizes these roadways, but we've heard from the community and neighbors that would like to use sidewalks within this area as well. So just, just a moment, Ms. Brenner. I have a question about significant length streets. So that designation then means that any improvement on properties, they have to put in a sidewalk. What else does it mean? being a significant link street? 
right now we're kind of looking at sidewalks. The, the word significant links is a city of Newport Council designation. That's mm -hmm. not something in the Federal Highway Code. It's, I think it was an attempt by the council at the time to, to identify links that we need between schools and critical areas and how to start getting uh, pedestrian facilities into those. So, but, but the code allows you to do frontage improvement. Let's say it's a vacant property. We could have them put in curb and gutter. We could put out them street trees, <coughs> sidewalks. All those are within the realm of public improvements that are uh, tied to development. The primary one we're looking at, though, is sidewalks. Tonight we're talking mainly sidewalks, pedestrian improvements. So, so that is a significant designation to property owners if they are on a significant length street then. It would be the, the council ordinance would require that those property owners on those streets that are deemed that way do put in the improvements when they, there's a redevelopment occur. Okay, what I'm really, what I'm really trying to figure out is it seems like all the streets in Newport now are significantly streets, like every street is heavily impacted. So I'm wondering what good it does us to have certain streets that just have that designation rather than looking at comprehensively all of our city streets. And what I'd say on that, if, if Fred, go back to that map you're proposing. What we tried to do here is lay out a pedestrian grid. You can see there's a lot of streets in there, but connecting those schools and looking for the primary ways to cut through this neighborhood, this gives kids and other folks an idea that they can get through a neighborhood on a sidewalk versus walking in the street. But I don't think it necessarily means you have to do every street with a sidewalk. In fact, this would not require Santa Ana or some of the other streets to put sidewalks in. That, that is not a requirement of council right now. You could, but those, when those develop, properties develop, we do not require a sidewalk at this time. So it's channeling more traffic onto certain streets and less traffic onto others, basically. You could say that, but these are certain, like Beacon is one of the streets that children use. We see a lot of traffic on that. Uh, Tustin is a cut through up to uh, 15th Street. Uh, and as we mentioned, Cliff there is already a significant link, but there's a lot of uh, connection with that. The interesting thing about Cliff is that if it was fully developed, we think, you would probably find that more kids would use that because it is a direct connection to Ensign Elementary School um, versus going up through Beacon. And we can talk about that in a few slides. Well, I think that's also going to be dependent upon what the school district does. And are you going to be telling us what their plans are? And just for the audience and the council, we did invite the, the school district to this. I don't believe they uh, are participating tonight, but they do know of the study session. Uh, they do have the information. Okay, and I, I think maybe the school districts are here. I can't speak entirely to their Ensign project. I do know they're doing planned construction there. As we understand, too, they're going to be channeling the entrance to Ensign to the corner of Cliff and Irvine, um, and which makes it more of a, a deed for Cliff to be the connection to Ensign if they're coming up from Riverside. We really kind of need to know what they're doing in order to make our plans. All right, Ms. Dixon. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just to clarify, on the existing significant streets, are there sidewalks on throughout the, the extent of all these significant streets? Are there sidewalks? Uh, they, it's a discontinuous thing. So the homes that have been remodeled or redeveloped at that level actually have put in their sidewalks. So as you drive through there, you'll see some long segments and you'll see some that are discontinuous where the new homes are. Or have no sidewalks. Or it, there would be it, none if it hadn't. I that. might suggest maybe when we discuss this again that can you create a graphic map that shows the existence of sidewalks or not on significant streets. I think that would be helpful. So on these existing blue or potentially green significant streets, if we decide to go that way, it would be the conversion would be dependent upon private development, correct? And so it would change over a period of years. So it's not anything that's going to happen quickly, but it would happen potentially. Is that correct? That, that's correct. I think the policy when they put significant link in was to introduce sidewalks in a gradual manner. They're slowly put into a neighborhood. And again, I go back to 15th Street. If you remember that street about a year and a half ago before we completed all the links, um, they were slowly put in as some development came along, and that would be the same thing here. At some point, future councils could choose. We have enough pieces in. Now let's just complete the project. And then to complete the project, or if we were to put in, well, let me just clarify what I think you were, I heard you say. So uh, maybe wider sidewalks are preferable to put both pedestrians and cyclists on an eight or 10 foot wide sidewalk is that 
Am I understanding that correctly? Is that preferable to a bike path, a bike lane? Uh, you could do that, in fact, on Cliff, which we mentioned, Riverside, that's a 10-foot sidewalk. That is a pedestrian and cycle bike way. 10 feet works real good for two-way traffic, as Mr. Muldoon alluded to, maybe a, a wider. You can actually have pedestrians and cyclists on that. So that would be one way to do it, or even if you wanted a wider sidewalk, like six <coughs> foot, is more comfortable for people walking side by side. Um, but I'm just trying to understand, is there a, a preference to widen the sidewalks to allow for both pedestrians and bicycle cyclists? I think if, and Brad, correct me if I'm wrong, but you would prefer a sidewalk over a strictly a bike lane because it allows for both traffic. We put the people on the walkway and the bikes on the walkway versus trying to just have a bike lane. Well, that means people are still walking in the street. So it might be helpful to see a visual uh, update of these charts that on the existing sidewalks on the significant <coughs> streets, what is the width of those sidewalks? Are they consistently uniform or are they, do they vary? Uh, from what our experience is, it's generally five feet because that's our standard right now. And I think Brad had a slide just earlier. You saw one of the new homes that went in and it's a five foot sidewalk in front on cliff. Um, so five foot though is not wide enough for both bikes and pedestrians. Currently that would not be, you could if you had two way, but that would probably be a little narrow. Okay, thanks. All right, go ahead. So the second consideration is actually to look at Beacon and consider installing the sidewalk or constructing the sidewalk between Irvine Avenue and Fullerton. Now the area here shown in Cyan is per the prior consideration of adding Beacon to the significant link policy. And then the pink section here is where we're considering actually constructing that section of sidewalk. Now this picture here is taken and it, it does resemble what we see in the morning where we see that Beacon is used as a pickup and drop off area. There's a good crossing directly into the school. And as was noted, the school district does have, or there's a current discussion about potentially changing the access points to this. So this is something for consideration again, but we will be watching and seeing or waiting for the school district decision. Um, Excuse me, can I say something? Ms. Dixon. Well, I would just make a note so I don't forget this. Uh, when we just continue this discussion during the discussion, um, do we, you just said, do we wait for the school district to get back to us? But I would like to be more proactive in our conversations with the school district once we decide to hear what our recommendation will be going forward for staff. And they're just recommendations. But these are not final decisions and actions. But... I think we should be more proactive with the school district. I just don't want to lose that thought. Thank you. Keep going. So the idea here is to move forward with this as a capital improvement project should it be something that the community desires. Now, three of the four homes on this, this section actually are new homes with newer landscaping and are properly set back. The fourth home is an older home, but is properly set back, but would have some more private improvements that we would work through. Now. What we see out there doesn't appear to be anything that we have not generally uh, worked with on other capital improvement projects. <coughs> the third consideration, I think this comes back to Mayor Pro Tem Avery's uh, question, would be to complete the cliff drive sidewalk by completing that 10 foot sidewalk or taking all the way from its current terminus at Riverside all the way to Irvine Avenue. And again, this is to provide that continuous path for residents as well as the school children moving up into the neighborhood and down into the coastal areas. Now, when looking at Cliff Drive, again, we talked about we have a bit more room here. And this exhibit, although a bit busy, again, goes to Mayor Pro Tem's point where in looking at it, staff feels that we could potentially narrow the roadway itself to help limit the impact of the wider sidewalk in that public right-of-way section. So in looking at this and knowing, say, that the lanes are 14 feet, we could probably narrow those a bit, which has been known to have a bit of a traffic calming effect, so that's a positive for this roadway. But then that would allow us potentially to, instead of taking a full 10 feet out of that, that 12 foot public right away, reallocating that, maybe we can split that difference. Now this time, I think a, a target would be, say, five and five, or five feet out of the public right away and five feet out of the roadway narrowing, but that would have to be determined later through some preliminary engineering, as would the consideration of, of other private improvements. We know there are some retaining walls and some other facilities that we'd have to take a good look at. All right, just a moment, Mr. Avery. Yeah, I think Brad, you touched on the 
the sort of the double win of this. Um, I, I've heard from a lot of residents, of course, my own experience driving around the Heights. People tend to really fly along this stretch right here. And I think a benefit would be the, the traffic calming, as I guess studies have shown that you narrow the lane and traffic moves slower. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Generally, that narrower lane creates a more constrained feeling for the motorist and, and allows They're less inclined to step on it. Hmm. That's, yes. Thank you. <laughs> And that concludes our presentation. <laughs> All right. Council, do we have any uh, questions or discussion at this time? We'll, we'll have more after. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll uh, go out to public comment. If you'd like to speak on this item, go ahead and line up through the middle there. Uh, we have two podiums. Both mics are working. When someone else is speaking, you're more than welcome to join at the other mic and just uh, wait your turn. Come on up, please. My name is Flo Martin. Uh, I'm a 53-year resident of Costa Mesa. I have been a member of the city's Bikeway and Walkability Committee for the last five years and am now a board member for the Costa Mesa Alliance for Better Streets I also bike. My husband and I have a tandem. We've done long distance tandeming all over the country and overseas, and I also walk. I'm close to 78 years old, and I walk with a cane. Unfortunately, I can't walk all the way through uh, not only the city, uh, streets on my, in my city, but also the streets in Newport Beach, which I do on a regular basis. I love to walk to Back Bay from my house. Uh, I strongly urge you to look forward to the future, to look for developing active transportation options. The streets are not just for motorists, they're for pedestrians and cyclists as well. They are public roadways for all of us who pay taxes. I looked at the first slide of the Sharo, and my first memory was Brock McCann. Sharrows are not safe. Bike lanes are, sidewalks even more so. Uh, I strongly suggest that you look to the future for active transportation. Costa Mesa is doing just that. We have developed an active transportation plan. It's been in effect for two years. And we're now starting to develop a pedestrian master plan. Pedestrians have a right to be in this world. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. My name is Jim Carlson. <clears throat> I'm a 40-year resident of Newport Beach. Live on Cliff Drive, 2300, right in the middle of the section that you're anticipating uh, widening. Uh, I send all the council members a detailed uh, analysis uh, of what the feasibility is to do some of this. <clears throat> in my opinion, a 10-foot sidewalk like, like down on Riverside by the park there, is uh, not feasible. It'll require the houses are set back and, and raised up. It'll require the complete change of the stairs, major retaining walls, um, <clears throat> and other things. It'll make their front yards uh, almost unusable. And a lot of those are view homes and things like that. I know that's not a public consideration, but the front yard access is really a major deal. Um, Right now on the 2200 block, which is adjacent to Irvine and, and Fullerton, the city is doing, um, well, I guess it's a five foot sidewalk, but inside the curb to the face of the retaining wall is four and a half feet. So it's whatever the six foot, or it's four and a half. Uh, <clears throat> so those, those work, but uh, to go any further, uh, on the 2300 block, my house was built in 1947 is, and is not, I have a little driveway, a little walkway, but around the corner there's nothing and then the other side that goes all the way down there's no sidewalk the house next to that I measured that my, my steps a four and a half foot sidewalk from the inside of the curb to my step would work and without a major change but the house next door and all the ones down below that would require major changes there's three feet there now and so all that has to be redone um, I, I, I think the pedestrians and things on Cliff Drive are okay and, and the bikes lanes, 
I do agree with Mr. Avery that the traffic is just out of control there. I'm not sure that the white, I like the, the narrowing of the lanes, but I, it might be dangerous there because they go so fast. So that's, that's my uh, take on the, I would, I would suggest that you do a very detailed engineering analysis and a cost estimate because it's gonna be expensive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon. Excuse my voice, it's nearly gone. Um, my name's Kurt Herberts. I'm a resident of Newport Heights. I live on the corner of Clay and San Bernardino. Have lived um, on Clay Street for 40 years now. I'm a Newport Heights resident for, for 64 years now. Um, I'm primarily concerned about the discussion on Clay Street. Uh, it seems like we're going backwards. In our previous discussions on the prior improvements that were proposed, uh, we did get very late notice in terms of what was going to occur and it was kind of felt like it was being force fed on us. The city council was very gracious and allowed us more time. We were able to get the word out to people and ultimately we had 120 people that signed a petition saying they did not want what was being proposed for Clay Street. And I feel like that's what's happening again. I just found out about this last week. Um, I understand this is a study session, but what happened previously was a study session. And ultimately we think our councilman, uh, Mr. Avery, for setting up a public hearing that occurred in our neighborhood in the Heights, and we brought everyone together, and we had a very good consensus on what was desirable and what wasn't, and there was an ultimate resolution and with the sheriffs, all the signing, everything was approved with the exception of one item, and that was the elimination of the um, parking on Clay Street, and the alternative to that was the sheriffs letting, uh, putting up signs that indicated that bikes had the right of way, and it appears to have been very effective. But one of the questions that was asked at the end of that was, is this it? Are we gonna have to revisit this? And the assurance that I was given is, we think we have everything handled, we're gonna implement and go from there. So now, last week I find out there's a new program, and all of a sudden Clay Street's now being considered a significant link, and it's like, what does that mean? I understand that may just right now mean uh, a sidewalk in the future, but oftentimes when you go to the city to do um, other types of items, you're told, well, it's now a significant link, and it also includes A, B, C, and D. And I appreciate what Council Member um, Brenner indicated about what are the implications of that, but I think that we need a lot more indication in terms of what the limitations are or how broad can this be and before we go down that road. Uh, and the last statement would be in regards to significant link. Who has designated this Clay Street and the others a significant link? Is this being proposed or has it already happened? If it's already happened, why hadn't we been told about it and given the opportunity to speak to it? Thank you so much. Thank you, next speaker please. Good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Kate Maloof, and I live at 526 San Bernardino Avenue here in Newport Beach. My husband and I and our three children have lived in Newport Heights for the past 13 years. I currently have two children at Newport Harbor High School and one at Ensign Intermediate. All three of my children have attended Newport Heights Elementary School and for the past seven years, when my children became of safe age, they have either walked or rode their bikes to school, to junior guards, or throughout the Newport Heights neighborhood to get to and from practices, meetings, and events, all without incident, and all while following the rules of the road. We are unfortunately <clears throat> privy to the horrific tragedy that occurred in our neighborhood a few years ago with the death of a fellow student from Newport Heights Elementary. I would like to thank the city council as well as the city of Newport Beach at that time for its immediate response to install a sidewalk on the southwest side of 15th Street following that tragedy. I would also like to thank those at the city who were instrumental in getting the sharrows and signage completed on Clay Street 
prior to the start of this 2019-2020 school year. Also, the added crossing guards for all three schools in Newport Heights neighborhood, Newport Harbor, Ensign, and Newport Heights Elementary have been welcoming and helpful to all those who commute through and around these schools during the school year. So why are we here today? What is the need for this additional traffic study session? The actions I mentioned above and accomplished, uh, have been accomplished by the city and in partnership with the school district are working. The, the Newport Beach Police Department and school administration, specifically at Ensign Intermediate, have bike safety assemblies at the beginning of the school year and regular ongoing discussions with students about bike safety and rules of the road. I recently spoke to the chiefs of police at Newport Beach and Costa Mesa, and they reported that they have limited bike accidents, and those that have been reported have been either people who are driving while on the cell phone, or bicycle riders not obeying the road rules, or riders with cell phones that they're using. And most of these bike accidents seem to happen right at the beginning of the school year. As a 13-year resident and a parent of three children, I cannot speak for all the parents in this neighborhood or all the residents of this neighborhood, but I am an active community member, as many of you know, and I am a listener. And I will tell you that many, if I may finish, that ma many who could not be here today are frustrated that the traffic issue keeps coming back up. I, like many, believe there are several issues within this city and community, and we should be focusing on those issues instead of bringing this back to the table. I mentioned I am a listener and a very small group of people whose position and desire is to put sidewalks in our neighborhood, I understand. But before we go spending money that is not in our current city budget, I would like us to explore a reasonable option such as directional time restrictions on Clay and Beacon between Irvine and Fullerton. The direction time restriction is a proven option on Irvine by Newport Harbor High School, and we should try these options before anything else. All right, Ms. Maloof. Thank you very much for your time, and please let us move on. Thank you, all right. No, hang on, no, 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 no. Just to be clear, the way we do it here is same as the Coastal Commission. If you'd like to show your appreciation for a previous speaker, just put your hands up and just kind of move that a little bit. We'll understand, trust me, appreciate that. All right, next speaker, please. Uh, good evening, my name is uh, Jim Kasuba. I live on Fullerton, fairly close to Beacon. So my concern is I'm looking at Ensign and it's actual entrances on Cliff. It's not on Beacon, it's actually on Cliff. And I did also talk to somebody from the school district lately, and they tend to s indicate that for the safety of the children, they actually need to have a single point of entry in that school. This is for like safety from things that occur to in our schools these days, not from traffic. And they also were hoping it would be near the front offices so they could monitor that all the time. So taking that in, it doesn't make a lot of sense that you would put a sidewalk on, on uh, Beacon Street because odds are if, if the school board actually does what's right for, for the safety of the kids, that entrance will be on cliff. It's possible that the politics of the situation causes that not to happen, but you would think that they would vote for the kids' safety over anything else. So looking at the plan, you know, I don't, the biggest problem I see down there, living there, is the sidewalk situation on cliff is terrible. It's a really busy street. There's very difficult situations over there from narrow sidewalks and sometimes missing sidewalks. And a lot of kids are coming up from that peninsula to enter that ensign school. So Cliff is an obviously a good choice if it only had the sidewalk situation fixed on Cliff. I think that would be something that would actually work regardless of where they put the entrance of the school. And also that's the busy street that needs the protection, I would think, for people that walk. So that's, that's a very important, I think, is that we try to put the sidewalks on the streets that have the front entrance to the school, not a side entrance that's not really where it may land up being in the future for safety reasons. So uh, 
thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, uh, my name is Matt Montgomery. I'm, not, I'm at uh, 328 Fullerton, which is the corner of Fullerton and Beacon. I think one of the staff members mentioned that we were one of the four houses that were was recently redeveloped. Um, I thought Mrs. Maloof basically summarized everything. I think things are working. I have three children. I happen to have one at Heights, one at Ensign, and one at Harbor. I've lived there for 15 years. I knew what I was getting into when I bought that lot. It's a corner lot right adjacent to Ensign. I knew what I was buying. It's a unique neighborhood that we all love. Some of these plans just will destroy the uniqueness that we have there. And I'll tell you what, one of the safest spots to get dropped off is right in front of my house because you can't move for 15 minutes in the morning and 15 minutes in the afternoon. You can't move. I can walk out there anytime I want. There's bicyclists, 80% of the kids are taking their bike to Ensign, okay? They're not gonna get up on a sidewalk, get back down on us off the sidewalk. I mean, I won't be able to walk out of my house if you have a sidewalk, at least they're in the street. Like I said, cars move at a snail's pace, people use alleys, et cetera, but this is just, I, I don't know why we're talking about it, as Mrs. Mrs. Maloof said. Um, I'm really encouraged that the school district's here tonight. I think I would love to see their plan. I think, I think there's a plan there. I mean, that school is, I mean, the acreage that it has, there's potential there. They don't use that acreage. And there's ball fields, which I've coached on many years. But there's, there's a solution in and around the school. But to, to, to modify the uniqueness, the lack of sidewalks, the lack of, of street lights, it'll devalue our property. So I just ask you to really consider what we're talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good, uh, I guess it's actually almost evening. Uh, I'll start with good afternoon, members of council. I'd like to thank you and the city staff for the time and effort you've invested in exploring ways to make the heights safer for all pedestrians and bicyclists. My name's Peter Boyd and I live at 505 Santa Ana Avenue. Uh, I attended Ensign and Harbor, rode my bikes there from uh, M Street on the peninsula. I have a son at Heights right now, a daughter at Harbor. Um, obviously, this is a contentious issue. Uh, you know, this area was first platted 100 years ago, and when it was first platted, they didn't think about this when they developed it. And I think along the way, uh, your predecessors have, have made changes and tried to address the concerns. Uh, something I've read in the city report that kind of struck me is there's this word urbanization is mentioned. Like, we don't want to urbanize this area. Well, according to the National Geographic Society, the definition of urban is a region surrounding a city. And it goes on to state that most inhabitants of urban areas have non-agricultural jobs. Urban areas are very developed, meaning there is a density of human structures, such as houses, buildings, and roads. My house was built in 1946. It was an urban area then. There aren't sidewalks, but I don't think that uh, is something that has to change overnight. But I think adopting that plan to start thinking about designating some of these streets as significant link streets and requiring sidewalks has a lot of merit. When I did a remodel, I had to go underground to the pole because I wanted to? No, because your predecessors decided any improvements in case there's future undergrounding need to go, you know, you need to have your panel go underground to the pole. I think we need to plan for the future. A lot of the planning decisions, as you know, are getting taken out of your hands with the state making density choices for us. And I think there's only gonna be more traffic and there's gonna be more competition for uh, safety on the streets. So I would like sidewalks around the schools. I'd love a sidewalk in front of my house. I actually have one, I put it in, and you'll see people walking down Santa Ana in the street, and then they jog in, they walk 50 feet on my little sidewalk, and then they go back into the street, which is kind of a crazy concept, but I, I think that's a really common sense future plan, maybe in some areas, do it now if that's the greatest need. But requiring it for future development, I, I think is appropriate. And the other aspect is, 
I put a sidewalk in because I don't want people crushing my landscaping. You know, I'm on Santa Ana at Halloween. If you, if you have any, uh, any landscaping you care about, it's going to get destroyed. And so one other thing is this is a contentious issue. I appreciate the leadership you've all shown. I appreciate you giving us additional opportunities to talk about it. Obviously, this room is not together on this issue. I will say, though, I appreciate the notice. I know in the past there was a claim that people didn't know about this. I got my postcard. That's why I'm here. And so I'd like you to consider doing what we can to make this a safe neighborhood for everybody. Bicyclists, pedestrians, adults, children, dogs, all of them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Um, I have pictures. Can I hand them? Yep, so I'll tell you what. If you hand them to the, our city attorney right there, he'll make sure we get them. Good evening. My name is Waverly Lasila, and um, I've been living in Newport Heights for 35 years. I bought my house when I was 25 years old, and I live on the corner of Irvine and Clay, which um, is a very popular little street. Um, I adamantly oppose sidewalks and bike lanes being put along Clay. Uh, this absolutely takes away from the uniqueness of the Heights. I also adamantly oppose Clay Street from being uh, labeled as a significant street. This is burdening us with the owners with even more traffic, and then in my case, burdens me with too significant uh, having to take out all my trees if my house is then labeled and I'm having to put in sidewalks. I've not redone my house in the 35 years I've lived there. I've remodeled and put in things like that, but never to take it down or do any significant remodeling. Um, Everyone knows this corner in this house with the house with big trees on it, and the Heights is known for its charm and its unplanned neighborhood with its custom homes and beautiful landscaping, which is on my property includes the three gorgeous ficus trees that are hard to miss. These ficus knitted trees are approximately 80 years old and are healthy and add to the neighborhood, providing a gorgeous cre a green belt along, uh, uh, along with having up lighting, which are li uh, light up at every, uh, all, at every night during the evenings and every corner during the... Um, across the street, excuse me. My neighbors also followed suit and have placed up lighting in their trees. Um, you'll see several pictures of the trees throughout those. Um, I wonder if there's a, a, been a recent count of pedestrian or school kids on Beacon, Clay, or on 15th to determine their routes. Most kids exit their schools and take the shortest path home. Kids, kids leaving from middle school naturally take Beacon, Cliff, or head north or south on Irvine to take 15th. The high school kids then get driven or picked up and if walking, exit the school grounds and are again taking 15th or walking along Irvine. Very few, if any, walk south or north on, on Irvine then to go down Clay. It just isn't the shortest route. It just isn't a direct route to get to from the schools. I also went to Harbor. I know the shortcuts. It's not going down Clay. Kids don't in exit their schools, then walk up and down Irvine to go to Clay. Um, a suggestion I think uh, that I would have a, an alternate is to, uh, to limit parking along Clay, like the hours that we have on Irvine when it's school. Therefore, the areas that are often um, used for parked cars then can be used for bike lanes during the hours for kids are going to school. And then it alleviates the trees and landscaping from being removed, which would be a significant impact on my property because I love those trees. I would do just about anything to save those trees. I'd let you take the house instead of the trees. I'm not kidding. I was, I was absolutely saddened when they took the, the eucalyptus trees off Irvine, when they dropped those. And we won't go into that, but um, I'd like the... Um, Just, you can finish up. One last thing? Yep. Um, I'd like the committee to be more proactive with the schools in respect to limiting class sizes, hence the schools, the amount of children we're putting through the schools. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, my name is Carol Ann Drew. I live on Kings Road. I've lived there in Newport Beach for 42 years. Um, so here's the deal. Car dealers are using Kings Road and Cliff Drive for demo rides. I can't speak to the other streets, but I can speak to these streets. The um, president of the Homeowners Association is preparing to go to these car dealers and speak with them. Um, and, and if they don't follow through, then B 
because he used to be a car dealer, um, he knows that if they contact the manufacturer, the manufacturer will deal with them, number one. Number two, y'all have narrowed parts of Cliff Drive, and it does absolutely no good at all, just so you know. Number three, I haven't seen any crossing guards at Ensign. Maybe I just don't see at 8 o'clock in the morning, but I don't see any crossing guards at Ensign. They could use another crossing uh, crosswalk, and they could use three people out there helping with that street. So this, the school needs to step up. Number four, um, people are disrespectful and they don't care or they don't know that the speed limit in front of a school is 25 miles an hour. The rest of Cliff Drive is 30 miles an hour. They also seem to have forgotten that they need to stop at stop signs. They aren't. They aren't. We had stopped at a stop sign on Cliff Drive and some idiot drove around us and continued through. Now, that was irritating and my husband gestured wildly at these people, <laughs> just so you know. Um, yes. Um, I was told by the by the parking police not to go like this anymore or our neighbors shouldn't yell slow down um, because they're afraid they might shoot us. That's just what we were told. I don't know. I don't know whether it would be true or not, <coughs> but I'm 76. If they shoot me, it's not going to be any big loss. <laughs> um, and I don't mean to be flip, but this is a real serious problem in our neighborhood and we really need to address it. So this, the Cliff Haven Homeowners Association is going to the manufacturers, we're going to the car dealers, we're gonna to talk to them. We put in next door neighbor little notes about, did you know the speed limit was 25 miles an hour on Kings Road? Our neighborhood is changing. The older people are selling their homes. We have young kids on Kings Road riding their bicycles. Give me a couple more minutes. No. Riding their better bicycles. Know, better know. <laughs> you, get a, you get a few more sentences. Um, riding their bicycles and learning how to ride their bicycles, roller skating. All of these things are important to small children. And they can't do it because people go around those curves at 55 miles an hour. Okay. It's embarrassing. Up. It is really embarrassing. So we need to school our, our, our drivers on what they need to do, and we need to step up. Honest to God, we need to step up because it's oh, awful. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you very you. much. All right. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Steve Moore. I'm the owner of the property at 501 Tustin. Um, it's actually in one of the pictures, specifically note, uh, I noticed as the pictures were going by in the initial presentation. So unlike many of the people who have spoken, um, I'm a new homeowner in the Heights, and I intend to live there. Um, pulled uh, permit, or we're about to pull permits to rebuild uh, the property, which is at the corner of Clay and Tustin. Um, when we were looking for a place to relocate to, my family and I, which includes four children, uh, looked at many locations within Newport Beach. We went and spent a lot of time in Corona del Mar, the Peninsula, we've been around the beach area for quite some time, and um, in discovering really the heights, we decided that's where we wanted to locate to because of the culture of the neighborhood, because of the feel of it. It felt like it was very homey. It was um, just a great feel in terms of that neighborhood. And my concern is that the changes that are being proposed would change that unique culture and feel of that neighborhood and really put that at risk. And really that's what I think a lot of the other um, neighbors and of course we love about that area. In addition, addition to that, um, the designation of the significant links. I have significant concerns about that and that it, that would potentially um, provide a risk of significant additional traffic going through that area over a period of time. 
um, that would not benefit the neighborhood, but would benefit only higher uh, density developers wanting to put uh, additional developments on PCH, which could enhance the risk to our community and our kids by having those significant links being designated in that way. Yeah, that's not something on the table right now, but is a concern for the future. And then of course, the um, concern about it being an unfunded mandate really ends up being what I believe is a tax on the citizens that live in that neighborhood. And that's really problematic for me. Um, you know, my family uh, is stretching to be able to rebuild there. We're trying to build something very nice that is great for the community um, and will fit in well. And to add potentially several hundred thousand dollars of additional cost could be um, dramatically detrimental to my ability to build there. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, good evening. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. My name is Scott Berman. I live at 606 Kings Place in the Heights. Um, I have one uh, child in Ensign and a child at uh, the Heights Elementary. First off, thank you so much for the work you've done so far in that presentation. Um, you know, I strongly support uh, making changes and doing a lot of what's in that presentation. Being someone that you know is driving down either 15th Street or Clay on a daily basis, picking both of my kids up from school, um, I can tell you those shadows don't really work that well. Um, you know, both from the biker's perspective and from the car's perspective, uh, I haven't seen any change since they've been put in. <clears throat> in addition, I think, um, you know, with the advent of electric cars, the bikers feel more comfortable. There's some sense of safety from those shadows that I don't think exists, especially as there are cars that are creeping up behind them that they don't seem to notice anymore. Um, so I do think bike lanes or, and or sidewalks are, are a much better solution. And I'm strongly in favor of, of you know, placing those in those significant areas that, that you spoke about. Um, I think there's also one street that wasn't mentioned that, that I do see living on King's Place. I see a ton of traffic in the morning and, and children walking and biking between where Cliff Drive hits King's Place, down King's Place, and then on 15th Street towards the high school. So I do think that's one area that should be considered when, um, when making any decisions. All right, thanks so much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Thank you. My name is Kevin Healy. I live at 464 Santa Ana Avenue, right at the corner of Clay and uh, Santa Ana, otherwise known as Halloween Central. <laughs> um, we've lived there for 25 years, had uh, two uh, wonderful daughters who attended uh, um, Newport Heights, uh, Ensign, and uh, the high school. Uh, we're very, very familiar with uh, the intersection and Newport Heights as well. Um, I'd like to echo uh, Ms. Maloof's comments, um, support that 100%, and that I think our neighborhood, uh, as beautiful as it is, is only becoming um, urbanized. I think that's the, the word of the day. And uh, I'd like to come up with um, maybe a couple of ideas rather than throw problems at you. How about a couple of solutions? One, I think we ought to better educate the students in Costa Mesa who are attending our Newport Beach schools. And I think that, in fact, we ought to have some kind of cross guard enforcement that, that tracks students so that they go down these significant links or designated roads like 15th Street uh, where there are sidewalks in place. There's no reason why we can't have this now uh, as corridors that are manned or volunteer help. I think I talked that, about that with you. Uh, Mrs. Dixon, and, and I think that, that would be a, a great idea. And I know the people in this neighborhood would be glad to volunteer if that was going to be a viable solution. So besides education and enforcement, I think goes along with that. Um, and yet, at the same time, I know our police force is under tremendous uh, burden and pressures uh, to uh, uh, police other areas, and we're somewhat spread thin. But enforcement, I think, could be a, a huge uh, uh, benefit for the neighborhood. And finally, <clears throat> if uh, we're looking at priorities, uh, I think we've got safety down. I, I think that uh, safety uh, with how we have maintained these neighborhoods for years and years and years, and the support that we've had with our residents uh, has been stellar. I think if we want to spend more money, we ought to be putting it into perhaps better lighting throughout Newport Heights. As you know, uh, most streets don't have street lights. Uh, or better yet, how about subsidize 
the utilities and telephone poles, and let's go underground. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. My name is Carrie Slayback. I live at 426 Riverside. Whoopsie. Pardon, what? pardon me. 426 Riverside oh, Avenue. I've. Ma'am. What? That's a, no, sorry. No. Yeah, we're going to need you to not do that. Thank you. What All did right. I do? No, 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 not you, ma'am. No, the behind you. But no, no, you're okay. It wasn't. It's not you. It's. Thank you. Okay, we'll, let me let's, let's let me start finish. The, let's, sorry, just a moment. Let's start her clock back over. Sorry about that. All right. Thank go you. Ahead. My name again. Anyway, I'm Carrie Slayback. I live at 426 Riverside Avenue, and I have personal experience with an effective low-tech speed governor. My daughter lives in Manhattan Beach. Uh, I drive along Pacific Coast Highway at fairly high speeds, turn left onto Gould Avenue, a residential avenue, and it's downhill. They have a flashing sign, and it gives the speed limit, number one. And you gotta put on your brake to do it. And you know why people do? Because people like my daughter have got a ticket and warned the mother, and the police presence there is occasional, and you never know when he's gonna be around. And I would like to suggest traffic control to look at two things. Residential area, flashing signs, number one. And number two, uh, occasional police presence, or more than occasional. It's effective. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Mr. Mayor, Honorable Council. Um, my name is Jeff Reuter. I'm a 67-year resident and uh, I live in a war zone. But I knew when I bought my house 42 years ago what I was doing. I lived directly across the street from Harbor High School on the corner of 15th and Irvine. I have no problem with the high school. And when I bought 42 years ago, 43 years ago, uh, it, was, it was busy then. But things have changed. And now 43, or 43 years later, it has become demonstrably different. Now we have electric bikes that go 25 miles an hour. Now we have, uh, it seems like a, a lot more people uh, walking the area and then heading down 15th Street to the west side. And since we put in the new sidewalks, which look beautiful along, along the path, they are magnificent. They're good, they work, they really, really do. But the whole area doesn't need them. It, it, it really doesn't need them. The two crossing guards, the two, young, the two gals that we have at our intersection, of 15th and Irvine, do a remarkable job. They own that intersection. I, I get nervous when I pull up the intersection. My house is right there. If there was some kind of an enforcement, and I'm here just to talk for one more second about the small branch of this big tree. You guys have your hands full. There's no doubt about that. This whole thing out here, they're all split up. But my little branch of the tree is that there's no designated drop-off area for Harbor High School, except for in front of my house, which is illegal. A couple times a day, for long periods of time, it used to just be a very short period of time, all the cars line up in all the red zones and everywhere else and sit and wait for their children to get out. When the children come up, get in the car, the, the ones that are on the street are also loading and unloading, and there's just a mishmash like this. Uh, it looks like a hockey. It looks like hockey. And there has been a very, very tragic accident that happened directly in front of my house on the side. I have 16 cameras on my house just for that reason, and it saved the guy from going to jail with my camera because that unfortunate accident was caused because the rules of the road were not followed, period. And if we can enforce the rules of the road a little better, instead of having the kids coming the wrong way down the street at 25 miles an hour on an electric bike and other, other people walking down the middle of the street because they just got dropped off in that area, I think it would relieve, it would relieve the pressure in that area immensely if there was some area where they had to drive to that was safe to drop everybody off. But right now, 15th and Irvine, it could be on Irvine, it could be on 15th, it could be on the other side of Irvine. It's a nightmare down there. The security 
of the, of the walking yards, they've got it handled. But you go 20 feet in any direction from the crosswalk, and it's a nightmare. Thank you very much, and I appreciate it. If we get some kind of enforcement down there, just for a limited time, to teach the students they can't do what they're doing, I think it'd solve this problem without having to add uh, the sidewalks, without having to add the widening of everything in the, in the bikes. Okay. Just teach them, okay. teach them how, to, how to go about it. Thank, Thank you. you very much for your help. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening, Council. My name is Chris Budnick, and I live on the corner of Fullerton and Clay. I addressed the Council about 18 months ago when the bike lane uh, proposal was being discussed. And at that time, I really felt the city had already taken a number of steps that really did improve the safety for the kids and uh, really addressed the legitimate safety concerns and avoided impacting <coughs> properties in a negative way. Uh, to reiterate comments from a few, it seems like we're going backwards now. Um, in regards to pedestrian safety for the students, uh, there really is no reason to add more sidewalks because you have at least not on clay because you have sidewalks already on 15th Street, it's just a block away. So if you look at the map, the students can easily use the existing sidewalks on Irvine Avenue and 15th Street to get where they want to go. Um, it's really not necessary to change any residential streets in significant lengths at this point in time. Now with respect to the continuous crosswalk or, or continu lack of a continuous sidewalk on Cliff, I'm going to let the folks on Cliff Drive address that. And looking at that, I got to believe there's a way to not have to put a 10 foot wide sidewalk in there um, and, and uh, impact um, the, um, the properties uh, so significantly, especially uh, the retaining walls. Um, one recommendation I would like to see included that I don't see in the presentation is a continuation of the Sharrows on Clay east of Irvine Avenue. Uh, contrary to what a few folks have said, I believe those sharrows do work quite well. I think they work very, very well. Not only are the bicyclists more cognizant of the cars, but the drivers certainly pay more attention to the cyclists because they now expect them to do pretty much anything within the lane. There's, there's no limitations on where the bikes can go. And everybody knows what it means to you know, protect the right of way, uh, so to speak. And, and so in summary, I'd, I'd like to see this process regarding at least the student safety just come to a close. I think as others have stated, we really got this nailed uh, at this point. Um, you know, for parents who really feel that it's super unsafe, they do have some options that they can consider. But for the folks living in the houses on the streets that you're potentially, you know, gonna put significant changes on, we don't have many options. It's hard for us to relocate. In fact, if we wanted to move right now, uh, we might be hard pressed to, to find somebody interested in buying until they get resolution on, on the plans that the city has for those particular parcels. So I encourage the city council to reject any portion of this proposal regarding uh, changing a, a residential street to a significant link. And in moving forward with Cliff Drive, please reach out to the individual property owners and work with them to come up with something acceptable. I'm sure you can find a solution there. Now, if the entire neighborhood wants sidewalks, that's an entirely different topic. But if we're gonna talk about that for pedestrian safety purposes, we should include every street in the neighborhood. And that includes all the streets in Cliff Haven and all the streets north of 15th Street. And there's something fundamentally unfair about targeting just a few streets. It's easy to get somebody to agree to impact somebody else's street for safety's sake the questions you should be asking are, do you want to see restricted parking in front of your house? Do you want a sidewalk in front of your house? Are you willing to tear out all the landscape and lose your trees to make room for such a sidewalk? I need you to wrap Thank up. you very much. Okay. Thank you. Next speaker, please. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Scott Barnard. I attended Ensign High School and I ride my bike every day. I went to New Barber High School, graduated in 77, rode my bike every day there. I have Bought a house in Newport Heights on 510 Tustin Avenue in 1986. I've been there 34 years, raised two kids, started with an 850-square-foot house that, like many people, would now fit in my garage. <laughs> Our kids biked or drove a car eventually to these schools. It's not very far, but they'd still do that. I'm against the... the, uh, the uh, significant link streets, and specifically on Tustin Avenue, 
uh, for various reasons. I think the Sheros are great, and I share the comments that Ms. Maloof had. I think the Sheros have worked great. The education has been phenomenal. I spent with Mr. Sinecori. I've met with three different uh, school district uh, trustees to watch what happens at Ensign and help uh, them understand what happens. And the crossing guards are great. The education of the kids is great. It's been fantastic. That's had more impact than anything else. But a little context on a couple of things. The kids used to <coughs> ride bikes and skateboard, and there'd be very few walkers, actually, that come through at Tustin. The, there's a handful. Most all of it is bikes and skateboards. Well, they've all started to become electric bikes. So because the bikes are going 25 miles an hour, which is, I don't know, three times the speed they were going before, there's now about a third of them on the street compared to before because they're there so quickly. I think it's the most dangerous form of transportation out there. I ride 60 to 100 miles a week all over the place, but the electric bikes are dangerous, but they do get off the streets quicker. There's not as many bikes on the street. Um, I think that the, these gentlemen over here would have these sort of perfectly engineered streets, but the reality is you shouldn't be putting cars on the same place you're putting the bikes, and even if the bikes are in a bike lane, many of the bikes aren't going to go on sidewalks. They're more emboldened and dangerous as they come flying off the sidewalks because they feel like they have a right-of-way. And the reality is the sidewalks aren't used by runners, and they're not used by bikes. So it really makes more sense to, like the Sheros on Clay, they, the cars calm down, the bikes use them. It's a mix for a period of time, but it's not an all-day, all-year sort of thing. Um, so when there's a few kids going to junior guards in summer, they still work. Uh, you know, if you had time a day, that only works on the school hours on the school day. So I think that the, the things they've done work well, but the sidewalks aren't just as simple as a gradual improvement. If you asked half the homeowners on 15th Street how the gradual process worked, gentlemen, it did not work gradual. The city came along and dictated that we're going to put in this public improvement on those homes whether they wanted it or not. And it isn't just a five-foot sidewalk. Every time you get to a corner, there's an ADA ramp to deal with. There's a fire hydrant somewhere, and they have to go deal with that and provide the ADA clearance around that. There's a storm drain that's in the way. They have to deal with that. So it's a more impactful. And then as soon as you move back, you've got a retaining wall. The retaining wall is, again, an urban element. So the street width, when you take away the trees and the landscaping and the pebble and the grass and the other things people got in their front yards, we have some tile pavers out there that are, make a great little sidewalk. At the end of the day, when you put all those things together, you would never think of asking the city to take out the ficus trees on Clay Street to put in a sidewalk there. And we tried to pay for ourselves to underground the electric, and we got a pop opposition from half the residents. So don't even start on the next thing, which will probably be streetlights. Okay. All right. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, council um, members. My name is Nancy Scarborough. Um, I brought my own visual aid and a personal assistant to help me um, show you. Um, the proposed streets of Tustin Clay, Beacon, and Cliff have under, over 140 special city trees. Many of them are very old and they would need to be removed in order to install sidewalks on those streets. City Council Policy G1 regarding tree retention, removal, and maintenance of city trees states that, quote, city trees are an important part of the character and charm of the entire city and provide environmental be benefits as well, end quote. Policy G1 further states that, quote, during normal sidewalk curb and street repair, all steps shall be taken to retain special city trees, end quote. The removal of any number of these trees would contradict the city council policy G1. We've seen how passionate residents are about their city trees. We've witnessed this recently with the Marine Avenue trees. We went through it with the Corona Del Mar trees on Ocean and Poppy, and also on the peninsula and Main Street when they took down the ficus. Residents noticed and commented loudly on the diminished character of their neighborhoods. On Tustin, Clay, Beacon, Cliff, there are 140 trees that would be removed for the installation of sidewalks. Some of these trees are 30 years old or more, some over 50 years old. You can't buy a tree that old. It takes four, three or four generations, if you put a new tree in, three or four generations for a tree to mature to that shade canopy um, of an older tree. And that contributes to the beauty of the neighborhood, which will be diminished for 30 or 40 years. Um, with all of the other problems that we have in front of us, including 4,800 RENA units, restricted, unrestricted ADUs, JADUs, 
SB 50, if it gets signed into law, we're gonna have fourplexes scattered throughout the single family home neighborhoods, climate change. We have a lot of other things to lose sleep over. I think keeping this in mind that the planning to demolish 140 trees and install hundreds of square feet of concrete sidewalks is probably not a good idea. Thank you very much. Thank you, next speaker please. Um, thank you, Council. Um, I live at 2948 Cliff Drive. I'm at the corner of Cliff and Santa Ana, and I'm an avid cyclist, and I often go straight up to Clay and go through. Often when the kids are on their way to the high school or the middle school, and I just wanted to put my experience, I've been in sort of, sort of the pack with them, and I think that, um, I forget what you guys call them, the, the posting, you know, the, I, the sparrows, uh, the icons work great. Um, I feel safe and I think it's working. I, I don't think anything's broken on Clay Street. I don't think we need sidewalks and I think the sparrows are adding a kind of an awareness. And so I just wanted to put a shout out for that. Thanks. Thank you. Um, well, the next speaker, do we have anyone else who'd like to speak after Mr. Klobe? All right, come on, come on forward and line up if you wouldn't mind. No, I've seen you. All right, go ahead. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, for uh, letting me speak this evening. I'm Jed Robinson. I live at 530 El Medina. I have attended all of the traffic studies for this issue and all of the meetings held in the community and have held some meetings in the community on this issue. I'd like to say just one thing because I think everything else has been expressed uh, fairly well. Uh, in attending all the meetings, I've seen the studies for the uh, walking traffic and the biking traffic. I've seen the studies for the uh, improvements that have been done based on uh, that information that the staff collected and is now implemented on 15th Street. One of the things I have never seen in any of this is the problem that we're addressing. It's a proposed problem, but there has been no empirical evidence that there is a problem. So how will we determine if what you're deciding on for the future is gonna solve something that you haven't displayed currently exists? Is there congestion? Yes. Are there cars and children together? Yes. You're not gonna fix that because you're not gonna take away the schools. You're not gonna take away the cars <laughs> and everybody as pointed out earlier will travel to those schools twice a day for uh, 10 to 15 minutes. And I think that the improvements based on the calculations that the staff did earlier with the charros and the sidewalk have made a difference. And I think we should continue to see how that plays out rather than now adding solutions to a problem that may not exist. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Charles Klobe. I'm a nearly 30 year resident of Newport Heights. I'm also the president of the Newport Heights Improvement Association, RHOA. I speak to you today on a familiar subject, modifying the streets of our neighborhood. First, a little history. Between us, Nancy and I have four boys. We moved here because it was affordable to us. We had a young family and wanted the best we could afford for their upbringing. We found it in Newport Heights. We raised three of them in the home we still reside. They attended Newport Heights, Ensign, and Harbor. Now Nancy is a grandmother to an eight-year-old girl. I expect to be a grandfather in April to a baby girl. My son and his partner live on the peninsula. Today our boys are all adults living on their own. I have firsthand experience raising children here. Newport Heights remains the least expensive entry point to single family home ownership in Newport Beach. The neighborhood is still largely full-time owner occupied. We are experiencing an influx of young families. They are attracted by the uniqueness of the neighborhood access to good schools and recreation, and lower cost of entry to Newport Beach. Developers have bought older homes and built large new homes, and families have remodeled their one-story homes. Folks who live here and move here know what to expect. A neighborhood without sidewalks and streetlights. This is part of the draw and makes it a destination. Now following a traffic study done in May 2018 where nearly everything recommended was adopted and implemented, we find ourselves here. We have seen one postcard inviting us to this study session at four o'clock on a work day. Once here, we are treated to a slideshow that proposes to change our neighborhood forever. Only we aren't asking for any changes. Most real residents of Newport Heights have no idea what befalls them. 
Designing, designating Beacon, Clay, and Tustin significant link streets is a giant step toward the destruction of our neighborhood. By acquiring, requiring homeowners to pay for this one of the most, uh, is one of the most outlandish things I've seen before this council. First, there's been no study that has determined that sidewalks are necessary. Second, most residents of Newport Heights and all residents of the affected streets oppose this. Third, you are proposing we pay for something no one who lives here wants. And then there are the trees that would have to be removed at our direct expense. Did someone not learn anything from Marine Avenue? After an apparent false start, we are embarking on a general plan update to the circulation element. Why is this even being talked about before we complete that? Tonight, you will be holding a public hearing on cottage preservation ordinance. This has been widely popular with residents. By designating these streets as significant links, you are contributing to the defeat of the effectiveness of that ordinance. Instead of remodeling the cottage, all the money goes to unneeded sidewalks, and you lose the mature parkway trees. I'm going to try something I tried earlier that seemed to work. Instead of trotting everybody down here to say the same thing, I'd like to ask everybody who agrees with me to please stand. Thank you for your service. Yeah. I do like that one, Charles. All right. Next speaker, please. Hi, good evening. My name is Peggy Palmer, and I just have listened here um, about everybody saying how these sharrows have really uh, worked and been effective in the neighborhood. So uh, Carol forgot number six, which uh, was her idea, <laughs> is to paint the 25-mile-an-hour on, actually on the streets uh, in bright green, just as the sharrows have worked very well in, uh, in Newport Heights. And also, as we sit here tonight on uh, February 25th, I want this meeting to resonate in your head when you hear the 215. Jeff, is that your phone? <laughs> anyway, I would like, uh, on t February 25th, you're going to hear the 215 Garden Project. And as uh, Mr. Webb and also the city engineer can tell you, there is an influx of children going to and from the peninsula. I do like the idea of improving safety around uh, the Stacey Bond, if you will, project. Um, another issue, or actually uh, an observation, is when this, the uh, schools start and end, the police volunteers have the volunteers. They are extremely effective. I don't know why we don't use them more uh, around the schools. I think that might be something we can look at. And uh, lastly, on Riverside, uh, there should be some crosswalk marking, some striping. I think we can all agree uh, to some additional paint and striping. And then Irvine and Cliff needs a crossing guard. And I think if we see j some striping, some changes uh, that tell people that they're coming into a residential neighborhood and put it bright green, 25 miles an hour, if the sharrows work, that'll work as well. So here's some simple, cheap solutions that I think we can all agree on. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Murphy McCann, and thank you very much for having this session and for doing the work that you have to have gotten us this far um, in providing safer routes for all pedestrians, kids, and people of all ages who walk dogs, bike, and whatever throughout the heights. Um, you know, I've, I, uh, I've heard a lot of the commentary, and um, I just want to support what you're saying by a couple of facts just to note the uh, recent deaths that have happened in the last five years in this neighborhood, uh, and the near misses as well. Um, there's been three on Clay Avenue, or Clay Street, uh, from the stretch from Irvine uh, eastward two blocks in the last probably two years. I think it's two years. Um, so that's all in support of what you're doing. Uh, you know, the... Um, I would like to either clarify or include a couple of things as when it comes to significant links. Um, Tustin north of 15th um, is a very, very busy street. It's only served by sidewalks on the Costa Mesa side, not the Newport side. And um, if you live on Margaret or Holly, um, you bas if you want your kid to go to Heights, you basically have to drive them because there is no way to get across Tustin without either sneaking through people's front yards or somehow miraculously crossing the street every morning to uh, the side where there are sidewalks. Um, 15th, east of Santa Ana, 
Um, again, there's a lot of housing going or already in over there. There's a lot of uh, traffic coming up um, on, on 15th westbound, either towards Heights L or all the way to the high school in Ensign. Um, the other piece is Santa Ana, which um, if you look at the details of the traffic study that was done a couple years ago, the traffic counts were the highest on Santa Ana for that first block south of Heights L. And I would suspect it stretches for another couple blocks beyond there. So um, the, as you know, I would say that, you know, with regard to the streets that you've talked about, Cliff, Tustin, um, and uh, Clay, uh, just a, a couple things to, to think about. Um, again, Cliff is, Cliff is a really fast street and there's a lot of upward traffic, bike traffic that comes from Lido and the peninsula to go up to Ensign and High School. Please do something about that intersection. I think it begs another stop or something. I put together, I mocked up what that intersection could look like. Um, so Tustin between Cliff and, and Beacon is, you know, that's just a real tenuous area. There's really bad visibility if you're coming south on Tustin. Um, it begs more than just um, what's been contemplated here, I think. Um, you know, what you're doing goes some of the way to solve the problem, but um, anyways, just consider that. Um, the other thing is potentially a stop at El Medina and Cliff, where you have the John Wayne Park, and there's a lot of residents that cross the street there that go check out sunsets. Um, and generally speaking, I'll, I'll keep this really short. Um, there's a set of guidelines uh, called NACTO that um, is outlines, you know, recommendations for how you put together uh, bicyclists, uh, pedestrians, and cars on crammed roadways. That is really what we have in the Heights. And um, there are a number of recommendations in there that um, if you could familiarize yourself with them, that would be great towards, uh, you, it would be helpful towards sculpting the solutions as we look forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Thank you, Sandra Ayers in the Heights. And um, I don't, I usually have notes and I don't tonight. So I hope I don't forget my three really important points, but they're going to be quick. So you can have dinner before your next meeting. Um, first of all, I want to say that I thought Mrs. Dixon's comment was very good and significant and made my little brain start going that um, you're hearing from the citizens, the people who live in the Heights. This is not something that we like. We like our community the way we like it, but, you know, people are here and saying, you know, with all the traffic and all the students, well, I, I think what Mrs. Dixon brought up the idea that why aren't we being more proactive with the school districts? Why aren't we out there saying there are these problems, these concerns that we have, and how can you help us with this? And I think um, with all the other great ideas that they've brought forward tonight, it's given an another thing to say, like, I think as a city I, and as a citizen, I would like my um, representatives to be working on that effort first before then coming in and significantly changing my neighborhood. If you could, you know, represent us and what we're really hoping for. Um, we have an existing neighborhood. That's why we live there. If people don't like it the way it is, I would uh, encourage them to go find a neighborhood that is the way that they want to live it in. And I'm not saying that, you know, that doesn't mean we don't make improvements, but at the same time, what you're talking about is significant changes, and that's a different thing. Thank you. Thank you. So. I'm not going to speak a second time, but when you have an open session, before all my neighbors leave, I want to give everyone an update on Ensign. Okay. Ensign. All right. Anyone else? Um, just I'm sorry, just a moment. Anyone else want like to speak after? All right. Okay, go ahead, ma'am. My name is Roberta Kennedy. I live it on the corner of Clay and Fullerton. My kitchen window watches everything that goes by, and I am unfortunately doing dishes a lot of the time. I thank you first of all for your patience with everybody and everybody is really frustrated. Um, what you have done so far in the last two years, in my opinion from what I see go by daily, is a vast improvement. The share lanes work great. 
actually everything is working pretty good except for about the 10% of people who are rude, inconsiderate, and don't believe that the laws are for them. This is true of 13-year-old boys, usually a group a year, that like to zigzag up and down Clay Street or any other street, whether there's a bike lane or not. The children that do what they're supposed to do are fine. The bikers, the pedestrians, the dog walkers, Everybody's great except for this 10%. And I don't understand who is keeping pushing and pushing this issue when the neighborhood doesn't want it. I don't want people in my kitchen with me. You put this, the sidewalks and the setbacks and everything else, that's what they're going to be doing, seeing what I cook. No offense. Um, the other thing is I am a senior citizen. I live on limited funds. I am lucky to have been able to stay in my neighborhood for over 30 years. I want to continue to do that. So tell me, because there's all sorts of panic going around about, oh, we're all going to have to pay for this. Who is going to pay for this? And why is it certain streets, and why not the whole neighborhood and everybody's property taxes get affected? Not just mine, because I'm in that first block. So, you know, has anybody told us how we're going to pay for this except charging the people who live there who are maybe not able to pay the assessment? Our property taxes are already sky high. You know that if you live here. <coughs> so I thank you for your patience, and I hope that you will take into consideration that no, a good share of us are not spring chickens anymore, and our money's going to cease coming in, and we can't keep paying and paying for things that we don't need. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's bring it back. Um, all right, uh, we'll bring it back up here. Uh, Council, uh, would anyone like to speak? Mr. Muldoon. Could you place consideration one up on the screen for the audience and those at home? Just so that people understand, I believe, correct if I'm wrong, staff, if it's in blue and you make an addition, you will be required to put a sidewalk in front of your house at your expense, correct? Uh, in blue is already existing in green would be this proposed that's right point. so if it's in green if changes were made which nothing's been discussed and you made a change to your house it would be at your own expense the city were to say we're requiring sidewalks you place in front of here uh, let's say forthwith it would be at the city's expense so it's either the city's expense or it's at someone who is have uh, a desire to expand their um, property taxes by increasing the value of their home. So for those who are situated with fixed income, it will not affect you on a financial basis. I still definitely understand the concerns on the physical uh, basis. So uh, could you bring us back to the slide that showed uh, Clay Street and it had the, the widths, had the, the basic and then how additions would look like? Thank you. Okay, so 36 inches, sorry, feet curb to curb. We need at least two 10 feet vehicle lanes by law, correct? That's our minimum width, yes. That's our minimum. And how wide does it need to be for um, parking? Uh, eight foot is the, probably the minimum you wanna go. So on both sides? On, if you have parking on both sides, correct. Okay, so what does that equal total, re legally required? Well, you need 36 feet, and that pr produces two 10-foot lanes and two 8-foot parking lanes. Okay. I'm going to pull, yeah, make a pull out my calculator for this one. I'm so bad at math, guys. All right, so essentially we are required, if, if you're saying the lanes must be 10, two of those, 20, plus 8, plus 8, so we hit the 36 already, essentially what is what you're saying. Yeah, yes, the 36 lays out to that, two 10-foot lanes, two 8-foot parking Yes, lanes. and what I'm trying to get is that there's no room to budge on this street without going into the right-of-ways. Is that correct? 
if you want to expand, yes, you'd have to go out in the right of ways. Okay. Now, if it were to go in the right of ways, what I had hoped to see, uh, and I, I didn't see presented because it, uh, there was a statement made that pedestrians have to be included, et cetera, was a simple, not that wide, one way guarded bike lane. And I didn't see that presented. Um, it could be, it could alternate based on the traffic flow in the day, but is that, is that something that you think be explored? For example, on the side, on the left side in this screen, which is heading towards, that would be um, heading southeast, correct? Where that BMW is on the left? I believe that, I think that's heading southeast, yes. yes. So if, if there were to be a protected bike lane only on that side, is that something, uh, what would be the minimum requirements for feet? So how much do we need to go on that right away? Is that something that's even legally permissible? I was just talking, excuse me, Mr. Summers. It, it, the guidance would be eight feet because you'd want a five-foot bikeway minimum and there's a three-foot buffer whether it's a raised something because you'd have vehicle access and exiting on that side against the bike lane. So it'd be an eight-foot thing. You could do it, that's actually the direction would be they'd want to travel south. You could make it a two-way, but it'd be a little confusing. Um, maybe you could switch during the day with the kids file the proper signage, but I think eight foot would be your minimum if you did. So, so you would need a three-foot wide curb for someone who's stepping out of the vehicle with then a five-foot-wide one-way bicycle lane guarded by that curb that, that then would abut the adjacent property landowners or any leftover right-of-way. Yeah, giving us a 12-foot right-of-way there, you'd have another four-foot to the actual An physical property line. Another four-foot, okay. Well, that is the kind of thing that I personally would be interested in, but I'm not interested in putting sidewalks and tearing trees down on the street personally. Um, I, do th I, I do think... Um, it may be time for the city on its own volition to make these existing significant leak streets uniformly curbed at our expense. Um, and, and that's something that I'd be interested in exploring, but I would like to see, as uh, Councilman Dixon requested, a detailed synopsis of what that looks like now, what the cost would be, how many um, island slabs need to be linked together. I, I think you probably do a much better job than I can of explaining it. Uh, and I, I, I believe, uh, that school district would do, a, do us all a, a favor if they were to change Enzing to Cliff and Irvine. Um, regarding Tustin, the, the, the scenario I just walked you through on clay, do you have a visual for Tustin? I didn't think I saw one. Okay. How wide is that street? Same? Same width. Okay, so we're, we're at a similar situation where we have to cut into existing right away taking away some lawn frontage on adjacent property, private property, if we wanted a guarded bike lane to exist. Yes. Okay. That, that's similar or something that I would be interested in possibly doing for one-way transportation on Tustin as well, but I probably there I would not be eager to see um, trees torn up and sidewalks put in. Uh, that's my position right now, but that could all change um, uh, with more information. And I'm sorry, just to clarify, um, you're in favor of the bike lane, but you're concerned about tearing up the trees. I'm just thinking the bike lane and the sidewalk would do the same thing. We didn't eat up into the frontage. Is that correct? Yeah, so if th this is a bad example because then if you see clay, you can see that tr the trees are a lot closer as that one lady in the red jacket showed. There's no room at all versus perhaps on one side there's room. I, I would need to see much more detailed <laughs> schematics, but... um. On these streets, it, I, I think it's very hard to make them both sidewalk on both sides. It, I just don't, I don't see it happening. And quite frankly, I'm not concerned about pedestrians. I'm concerned about children going to school on their bikes. That's what's driving me in this. And it, just because it's been heard before from many commissioner, you definitely should understand, doesn't mean it shouldn't be heard again. Uh, this is a serious issue that Costa Masons and parents are, are, are concerned about. It's not fun. <laughs> as we know from other um, incidents, but this is a, a work in progress. All right, thank you, Ms. Dixon. Thank you, Mayor. Just a couple of questions to clarify. Um, have we, in your considerations of different options, have we considered making uh, a Clay Street one way or Beacon Street one way? Where we would then not have to go into the right of way, the public right of way, and we could have extra wide in these areas surrounding the schools 
schools, plural. Uh, I don't believe we've looked at making those one-way streets. Um, again, that could be looked at. You're, I think you're referring to if we make it one way, we could lose one vehicle lane yes. and put striped bike lanes on the road. That is always a possibility. Um, we could look at that if you so choose to look at one-way streets in the Heights. I, again, I, I don't have to look not at it. Not necessarily plural, but just one way. related to ac the proximity to the schools or the feeding into Irvine. Uh, maybe just one block. I mean, we have one-way streets in many parts of the city that require particularly, you know, Corona del Mar, Belleville Island, I mean, and also on the peninsula that require an adjustment. Perhaps it's one way to consider that we don't have to go eat into the expense of the public right away, and it's really just about marking the streets. Also, um, and that would be a traffic calming measure as well, one way. I mean, just for obvious reasons, you don't have cross traffic and kids on bikes and people on pedestrians. I, one of the first speakers who spoke about what Costa Mesa is doing and thinking about the future, I think that's an important concept. Uh, we have to think about the future and, and be mindful of that. I don't know what specifically that means. We just have to be thinking of all uses. And also, uh, I, as I say this, I'm wrestling with, we've referenced the new laws related <laughs> to our neighborhoods that are now taking effect, that as more building occurs with ADUs and homes, there are no more, or there, there are no more, there are no longer any parking requirements. So we're going to be adding to the parking requirements on the streets of our city, or parking uses on the streets of our city in the future. Uh, so we have to factor that in, and from a safety standpoint. Uh, Mr. McCann mentioned some stop signs on Beacon, and I personally have experienced coming down Tustin as you approach Cliff, and the kids are there, and there's no stop sign at Beacon and Tustin, and it's a short distance between Beacon and Cliff, but it might be a, another traffic safety calming measure also at the corner of El Modena and Beacon. Uh, stop signs are good. But um, I, do, I too want to say that um, traffic safety is, is an ongoing issue, and obviously we up here and all of you are, are wrestling, and I think we all, with this issue, and I think we all want to minimize certainly the cost impacts and the uh, changes to it. We don't, I don't think anybody wants to change the neighborhood culture, but we have to be mindful that we have a lot of people on our streets, a lot of kids on our streets, and we have to be sure we are doing the right thing. And in that sense, in terms of our knowledge of incidents, um, I think it would be helpful the next time we, when this comes back to council, that we see actually traffic incident reports we need data to support what we're talking about here. I think that works both ways. Um, how many, I know we've heard this before, some accidents don't get reported, but we need to start with data too. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Herdman. You know, um, I'm sitting here thinking irrespective of what takes place on the streets, sidewalks, bike lanes, uh, narrower, driving lanes, the amount of kids that are still attending Newport L, Anson, and Newport Harbor High will continue to populate the streets in one form or fashion. And I've heard a number of times this evening that crossing guards might be a solution, a partial solution to this, and our chief of police is in the audience. I'd like to know if the process for um, acquiring uh, an additional crossing guard uh, involves our police department. I know when parents approach me at the schools, I was responsible for requesting a crossing guard. Uh, my instructions to them were to put it in writing, which they did, and that triggered me working with local law enforcement to secure or to look into the monitoring of the intersection where a crossing guard was being uh, propose to see if it would be warranted. So John, what's what's the deal here in the city of Newport Beach as far as acquiring a crossing guard? Certainly Council Member Herman, John Lewis, your Chief of Police, and we have studied crossing guards specifically in, in Newport Heights and we have added 
um, with the most recent study to certain right. intersections. Um, and the ones that, that were um, that were added were along Irvine Avenue. But that's always something that we can continue to study. We have um, crossing guards as a contract service with the city, and there's a fee for those crossing guards at the various intersections. And that's something that we work with uh, Mr. Webb's team to identify. And if there's a need there, then that's absolutely something we can look at, look at doing. So well. what's the process for parents who wish to see uh, a crossing guard provided at a particular intersection? What do they do? Do they work through the principal? Do they work through us? We typically, when these when these requests come, you know, they, they 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 come to me, the police department, or through our school resource officers, and we work in coordination with okay. um, with uh, with Public Works to uh, determine whether or not that is something that we're going to um, feels warranted at that uh, specific intersection. So it, it can start with either one of us. The the conversation about and it. and, it'll, it'll and what do we do? Do we uh, put a black black? Uh, do we how do we how do we determine whether or not a, a crossing guard would be warranted? What we do is we work, um, we study those intersections, and we look as um, Councilmember Dixon mentioned as, as well, is that the accident data with the with the volume that we're seeing in those areas of um, of people crossing, and there's a determination that's made there. In terms of that methodology, is is left to our engineering folks, and then we facilitate the um, the uh, addition of the the crossing crossing guard. guard. Okay, thank you, John. All right. So parents, you know what to do now if you're interested in in securing a, a crossing guard for an intersection. Yeah, and just to be clear, Chief Lewis, we have crossing guards at all three schools in this <laughs> in this particular area. I just want to I, I just want to make sure that's clear because I think one of our speakers previously had said they've never seen a crossing guard. I've seen many. So I just uh, Okay. All right. That's a different statement. Okay. Mr. Baird, to answer your question, yes, we do have crossing guards in that area. And as of the um, as of two years ago, we um, added additional crossing guards in that um in this general newport heights area that we're talking about at specific intersections and locations okay all right thank you chief mr avery yeah i feel um you know a number of speakers mentioned this i concur that there have been uh, um, a good number of improvements and i think out of the outreach that uh, we've done with the residents um, and council's participation and certainly staff's participation we've presented lots of options and um, there are lots of um, things that we could do further, but I think uh, it's at least to me, and this has been the case all along since the very beginning, um, is that the consensus is uh, to do everything we can to improve safety um, without literally tearing the neighborhood up and putting in sidewalks and, uh, and taking parking off the streets. And I, it just, it's just a reoccurring theme. That's not everybody, but I believe it's a, it's a solid majority. And maybe that solid majority is not represented here tonight, but most of the people here tonight um, are, uh, come to council, they pay attention. They, they uh, I think they do represent their communities. <clears throat> and I don't think we can ever build, obviously anywhere near a completely safe neighborhood. And I'm still, I go to work every day down Tustin and uh, as many people have spoken, there's always a few kids who are really um, not paying attention and not following the rules. And the same is true with some drivers. So that goes on all the time. And of course, it all it just um, really scares all of us uh, to death when we see that because um, we've had some experience with it and we don't want any more. But I think life being what it is, it's, there's a good chance we will see more and that's just the nature of cars and people coming together out there and we we're, I don't think there's any will to take cars off the streets or um, change make any significant um, traffic changes but I don't think we should give up or we, we should not stop trying to introduce changes possibilities to the public and I know this is a, it's exhausting to do these meetings and uh, We've been through a lot. Uh, people have taken time, but I think we all need to be prepared to listen and take the good ideas. And uh, if we can put in a stop sign, it'll make a difference. We certainly want to do that. And so the way we get these ideas, I believe, is from our community. They're the ones, we're all the ones that see what's going on out there through our kitchen windows and from our lawns and, and our own experience in driving around. And so <coughs> I think 
staff and Brad, you did an excellent job presenting these ideas. I think there's still some, I would like to see the Cliff Drive looked at, but in a way that would not tear, <coughs> tear up um, people's uh, literally very costly infrastructure improvements they've made along that way. So I don't know if that's a way to skin that cat or not. But um, overall, I, I, uh, I, I wouldn't uh, support any, anything beyond what I just stated in terms of making um, further quote unquote improvements for the heights. I think um, the group has spoken here tonight, certainly. And I'm always available to hear further comments uh, from folks if they weren't here uh, and uh, you know, take that to uh, staff. And of course, people can communicate directly to staff with suggestions. We've got to keep them coming because we just can't let up on doing the small things that when they're all aggregated make a, a considerable difference, which I think most people concur has happened over the last few years. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Duffield. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to thank everyone for coming. I know it's a pain. And um, I just learned um, a tremendous amount. Of, if you hadn't come, I wouldn't have learned. So, um, but I do want to uh, say that um, my district, which is connected to this, these streets, the, the word I'm getting are these sports cars on the Coast Highway come <coughs> up here for their demo rides. And I heard that tonight uh, briefly, and I know that's not what we're talking about tonight, but the darn streets connected. My, my district street, this cliff <coughs> and Kings Road are connected. So I just don't want to lose sight. I don't want this group to lose sight of the fact that these sports cars are coming up here doing what they're doing. I've heard nothing but horrible stories about the speeding. And uh, I know there's a, a, a group of folks that are, try, are going to try to present this to us again, but it doesn't have to do with the school, but it's the same street, same road. So I'm hoping we can come to grips with uh, Cliff and King's road to alleviate the speeding part as as well as obviously the schools i have great concern for the schools i went to all all of them as well so um please um, understand those of you in my district that i'm not going to drop the ball on the these speeding sports cars thank you to make sure everyone gets to speak first i'm going to go to miss brenner first oh sure go ahead I have so many conflicting thoughts that I was trying to pull them all together into some semblance of order, and I'm having a really hard time doing that. Is a school district representative here? I thought someone said, are, are they there, interested there in that. telling us what the proposed plans are? <coughs> you, beat, you beat me to it. Oh. That's okay. You got it. Short. Good evening, I'm Ada Zarezny. I'm the Administrative Director of Facilities for Newport Mesa Unified. Um, we have been working with some of your staff on our plans. Our plans go back quite a while, even before you did your neighborhood study. And so we actually paused our projects at both Ensign and Newport Heights, which are our parking lot reconfigurations and some fencing work. So now we're at the point with Ensign specifically where our plans are developed. We have gone to the Division of State Architect, who is the agency we work with for plan approval. We have those approved. We've bid our projects, and um, we are anticipating starting the initial phase of demo over our, what we call Ski Week, which is February 17th through the 24th. Um, we are phasing the project um, at Ensign, starting with a brand new parking lot, which is where the old bike bike racks were and so it's the corner of Coral and Irvine Avenue so we're putting a new parking lot and the intent is is to create a staff parking lot so we get more of our cars off the street and back onto our site um, the other area that we're improving other than just site fencing is off of Cliff Drive and we are building what we're calling a banana lot so essentially the parents would come off of uh, Cliff Drive pull into a driveway with some angled parking, and that would become a parent drop-off zone, which would be on the district property itself to, again, help relieve some of the traffic out on the streets. Um, we are, as part of the security fencing project, doing a single-point entry. 
So all of the kids will be coming in the front doors of the school off of Cl uh, Clay, excuse me, Cliff, thank you, off of Cliff. Um, so we are trying to have our students and our cars more so on our lots. We have been working with city staff on our plans. We paused our project while you were doing your neighborhood study. We've received comments back from city staff advising us of some minor things that need to be changed. There weren't any real major changes. I think the only one comment that we weren't able to accommodate was for the banana lot off of Cliff. The city had asked us to shorten it. Um, in order to be able to do a left turn into the lot, but we would have lost a lot of stacking on our property and parking. So we left that in place. Uh, the restriction of being able to turn left is really a median in the street. I'm sure it was for um, to slow down the speed on that street, but that could be removed if the city chose to want to have a left turn into the parking lot. So we're, in, um, we're getting ready to start the demo. We, the first phase of the project being that back lot so we'll be building about uh, 45 stalls in that back lot. That'll get constructed first before we do any of the improvements to the existing lot. So we'll make sure we open up that, that new lot before we move on to the existing lot so we're not taking down more parking that's already available there now. We are taking down trees, yes. Sorry, hang on, this is, no, no. Thank you. All right, council, do you have any questions? I'm, I, Sorry. Am I the only one that's surprised that they're this far along and that we didn't really know what was going? I, I feel like I didn't know they were this far along on this project. I, I can, I, maybe, I, if you could talk a little bit about what you've done at the board level because you've run this project. Staff's had a limited view of this project. In fact, we, I think we just saw something in January, a plan. We only connect with the encroachment print where they join the street. It's, it's under the guidance of the state architect. It's a little odd. But the school district, I'm, I don't know what your hearing process is on your projects and how you so, reach out to the community. So um, the district has a policy that anytime we do any major improvement like this, we have community meetings. And we also have, I've done board presentations at our board level. I've invited, so a couple of things with the site security fencing. Site security fencing is a very sensitive subject. Parents are concerned about their kids' safety on school sites, so that was a large element of it. Uh, our extent of inviting city staff and city, city police <laughs> was even to have your uh, police um, present at our our meetings, our public meetings, which the last public meeting that I had was in September at the beginning of the school year. So we've had quite a few of them and this didn't just happen. Um, and I know that there was some question as to the amount of communication between the city and the district and I have a comprehensive list of emails and, and times and dates that we've spoken. So we don't just go through the process of when we're at a point to build an improvement that encroaches into the city right away. Some of the uh, things that we need permitted by you all is the new driveways. So we've coordinated all of that. Yes, the contractor will come on board and he will submit his formal permit request and review of his permit to make those improvements. Um, but we've had conversations well in advance of now. Mr. Webb, would you like to say anything? Yeah, I was just confirming with Tony Bryan, who's the traffic engineer, seen this, and he has been working with the school district, but on a limiting basis. And I, that, why I asked the question, I don't know what kind of public comments, because you would review these projects through your own board and not through the council. We've seen limited of that, and, and again, maybe to Council Members Brenner's item, I don't know where the council has seen the school district act. It hasn't very been public to me, too. I know Tony's been seeing some glimpses. I don't know what the residents think. So that, what we control for the council's aspect is, limit offsite, and we've been told they're gonna change their gating plan, and we're trying to react to that. We can't really tell them not to, but we can say, okay, what are you gonna do? They wanna change their driveway locations, and we're trying to react to their plan there. We have limited ability to actually say you can't do that, um, and I think that's the area, where the comments, concerns, they wanna to talk to the school district and see your plan, basically. Well, then, um, <laughs> perhaps, uh, and I'll make sure you get to speak, don't worry. Um, perhaps the uh, part of the answer right now is, um, 
let's uh, after the meeting make sure that we are getting as much information on the plans as we can and put it up on our own website so that our residents can see it and uh, reach out <coughs> reach out to the school district in the morning and see what we can do to to accomplish that um, all right part of, Brenner. part of my concern is that if we're talking about perhaps narrowing Cliff Drive and and doing some traffic calming measures there would there have been a way if we were working together for us to save the trees and and um, work with you in order to develop what you need but still I mean it, it seems like if we I'm, I'm I don't want to appear frustrated to you because this is a frustration I've had for probably 50 years in Newport Beach that it didn't appear as an outside just citizen that our school district and our council were always on the same page about things and um, now I'm finally on the council so it's like maybe that frustration from years gone by is apparent but I just feel like our school district and our city should be partners in anything that goes on in our community so um, and this might be an example of where we could have helped you if if we were working together on that project I'm just gonna say I, I do feel like we reached out to the city um, on a regular basis for that type of coordination um, so just whether how far it the information was shared with you all is kind of beyond my control I one of the protocols that our board adopted for our projects in addition to just having a community meeting was we use the same parameters when we're going through CEQA California Environmental Quality Act and so if we're having an impact to the environment you have to notify residents within 500 feet of the property line and so even for our public meetings which don't require CEQA whether it does or it doesn't I have a community meeting and we notify those 500 uh, the residents within 500 feet just to have a, a kind of a standard as to who we notify uh, in this particular case the principal also sent out the notice to all of the families and all of the staff so there was large coverage as to the um, the meeting notification and it's on our website we do a blast of it for the school community so I'm sure we can improve that and I would be happy to be a part of that okay. thank you okay thank you uh -huh. thank you Ms. Brenner yes I had a couple of things just in general about the traffic situation in Newport Heights um, you know I, I as a longtime resident I'm totally understanding the attitude of we like it the way it is and we we don't want changes we bought this into this neighborhood when it was this way and we don't want you to make any changes to that but I also understand that we as council have to look forward we have we have the responsibility of planning for the future and unfortunately we're not going to be able to limit uh, future development as much as many of us would like I mean we would if we could we'd probably say okay we're done no more development whatsoever but it's not a realistic possibility and one of my big concerns about the development that will come down on Pacific Coast Highway on Mariners Mile in as limited a form as possible but it some will come um, is that they are going to drive through Newport Heights they're going to go to 17th Street to the market and the dry cleaners and the drugstore and I want to make sure that we make those streets as safe as possible for the residents and the bikers and and you know as someone who did a lot of strolling in the neighborhood with five grandchildren and two children in the Newport Beach streets I want to make it safe for walkers as much as just for bicyclists so I was intrigued by what Brad had to say about that the sidewalks that are shared are maybe one of the most efficient ways to move both bicyclers and pedestrians through neighborhoods safely I I'm not real excited about this designated streets idea of certain streets being it, it appears to me that that is like the school district says and we say our police department says we cannot tell kids this is the safest route for you to travel to school because there would be a liability involved for us 
And it seems like with these streets that we are basically saying this is the route you should take to school, that we're basically doing that. Um, I'm more concerned about us gradually improving the entire neighborhood, making it safer. And, you know, I, I think the fact that there are, it's a 12-foot um, public, what do, you, what do you call it, the part that is public right away adjacent to the curb, that possibly we, in Corona Del Mar, what they've done on the streets that don't have sidewalks is some of the homeowners have put in meandering sidewalks that go around the trees. And it seems like there's enough space there to do something like that. But I really, I thought all these years that it was required when you did new construction to put a sidewalk in because that's what most of the people in Corona Del Mar do. And our lots are a lot smaller in the village than the lots are in Newport Heights, but most of the people who do new construction put a sidewalk in. Some of them meander around a tree and some of them are just adjacent. So I would be very interested in continuing to enhance those sidewalks as the years go by. Okay, thank you, Ms. Dixon. Okay, I know this is really gonna be, <laughs> gonna be an interesting challenge that ultimately we give to staff that we're all done with this. Um, couple things that I think are easy fixes that I hope we don't have to wait for another public discussion. Uh, I would personally like to see how many, I'd like to see a map or the positioning of our crossing guards and their hours of operation just so we see how the coverage is working. Um, I like the idea in that context too, one of the, I think it was Mr. Healy mentioned about, and he had told that to me earlier on using the neighbors to be a part of uh, through the homeowner association can have volunteers to <laughs> position a few adults out there during uh, school traveling hours in the morning and the afternoon. Let's get the neighborhood involved because you all come out and say, don't do it, but show us how you can help make this neighborhood safer. Um, another probably a low cost or non structural change is uh, why don't we consider maybe it's the significant link is in our own policy. Maybe what's one step below significant link is just Safety Street and uh, Clay Street and Tustin and Beacon be designated as Safety Streets. And we do some painting on the streets to designate that these are, as I mentioned earlier, one way perhaps on at least Clay uh, to just to designate that. And we reduce the speed limit from 25 to 15 or something or 20, just, just to enforce greater awareness <laughs> and enforcement, uh, having, as one of the residents said, doesn't have to be a permanent officer, motorcycle officer, traffic control officer stationed there, but uh, occasionally there, often enough to know that, that it could become a deterrent. Uh, I do, we didn't, we have not talked about this, so I just wanted to bring up just to make sure that we're on, uh, updated on uh, the trash collection waste management system is just to make sure that they are abiding by all the new rules that we've established in terms of their hours of operation in this school zone. I just want to make sure uh, that they're compli in full compliance, so that's obviously not an issue going forward. Uh, I guess I guess that's where I am. Is uh, so maybe I'm saying that none of these consideration suggestions we go there first that we try some of these more non-structural changes I do think that people I've talked about this before in the Lido blinking crosswalk we have on in Lido village I can't tell you how many times a day that I'm stopped at I'm stopped to let pedestrians go in front of in front of stopped cars and the lights are not blinking and I'll roll down my window and I say please push the button and then I think I've said people use use unfriendly language and hand gestures. They probably don't understand what I'm saying. I'm just saying, push the button, save your life. Anyway, it's just, we have to go, my point is we have to go over and above common sense reasoning to in communicate to children and to adults that we have laws in this city and we probably have to use visual reminders, very strong visual reminders to get people to slow down. So thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I'll just uh, say a couple things. 
I agree with the vast majority of what uh, Ms. Maloof said. Um, it sounds an awful lot like at this point it's a significant enforcement issue. So quick reminder, when we started doing parking enforcement in Corona Del Mar, when residents were complaining, the vast majority of people who got tickets were residents. Um, so if, if you're asking for more enforcement, understood, just <laughs> don't come back here to tell us about your speeding ticket. Um, but uh, I'm, I think that that's, uh, that's a fair point. So that would be, that'd be something I'd suggest we, uh, we discuss a little bit with our police department. The other thing is, um, if you have questions for the school district, after hearing what you heard tonight, please ask, ask. So I would just suggest very strongly you ask lots of questions of the school district as well as um, attending their meetings because I suspect you have some questions. All right, Mr. Avery. Oh, did you wanna speak? Okay, Mr. Avery. Um, I felt that the speed limit, at even 25, you know, if you're rolling along at a solid 25, especially when the neighborhood's, you know, impacted with travel um, by all forms, uh, something jumps out at you, it's, you're, you're moving pretty fast. But I think, um, I understand that that's a state mandated speed. Can we actually change that in a neighborhood? Tony, could you come answer that question? I think there's, there is a state law governing that and that ex, uh, pro facto speed. But. Uh, staff, Tony Bryan, city traffic engineer. Um, there are certain circumstances where you can actually reduce the posted speed limit to 20 miles an hour. I'd have to check the vehicle code, but I don't believe the typical school zone is, uh, you can post it at 20, but you can, I mean, it is the standard speed limit in a school zone is 25 when children are present, some of the 20 mile an hour zones might be uh, around senior centers or, or uh, within park areas, but <coughs> we can double check the vehicle code. And then Tony, could you clarify on the local streets around it, not a school zone, can we go below 25 miles an hour? Well, if it's adjacent to the school itself, then we do post 25 when children are present. But like on Clay or uh, Tustin? Or? If it's adjacent to the school itself, so Irvine, uh, 15th, those streets are posted, 25 when children are present. But it's possible that we could ap uh, ap apply to the state and maybe get it moved to 20? We, we can go back and look at the vehicle code and see if that's a, right. a possibility. Thank you. All right, Ms. Brenner. I just, I was picking my granddaughter up at Corona de Mar High School today and according to what I saw, people can't even go five miles an hour around the school, so it may not be necessary to post it as a lower speed. But what I did wanna say is that I would like to move forward on the suggestions that we've heard about traffic calming measures on Cliff Drive. We've been hearing for months, <clears throat> months about the sports cars that use that as a racing zone. And um, I know that on 19th Street in Costa Mesa, when they put in their traffic calming measures at their corners, um, I started using 19th Street less for one thing, and it definitely slows down the traffic. And when you make a turn off of 19th onto another street, you have to go really slow to do that. And so it seems like that street is a problem. It's been a problem that we've heard from numerous citizens, and we've heard from Duffy and, and Brad and other people that that street is a problem. So if we could move forward with traffic calming measures there, I would support that. Okay, Mr. Herdman. Just one last thing. I heard the suggestion uh, about possibly using uh, H uh, parents uh, or individuals from HOAs or volunteer parents for getting kids across the street or supervising them to and from school. You just can't do it. You absolutely cannot do it for liability reasons. So don't walk away thinking that we're, as a, a body up here, are endorsing that or suggesting it. All right. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure that we've given you particularly clear direction on this one. Um, I'm not sure we're going to be able to, uh, frankly. So my suggestion would be take a, take this one, digest it. I will say, I think that a lot of the, a lot of the discussion up here will probably need to be covered anyway during the circulation element, um, discussions during the general plan process. Uh, so there's a good chance that, that, that a lot of that will need to be discussed there, but take a listen to what we've um, what we've discussed up here, and um, if there are things that are uh, 
<laughs> I hesitate to say this, but fairly non-controversial. Um, they can be done. That would be great. Anything else, uh, we need to do more public outreach. And um, I think we'd probably need to, uh, for those specific ones, we'd probably need to go through A1 for uh, council members because I just don't think we have general consensus on which direction we need to go with this one. So um, unless, uh, from the council level, that is, of course, if the city manager were to feel that she had consensus, she can bring something forward. All right, um, members of the public, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate hearing from you. Uh, you're always, of course, welcome to send us notes and uh, show up again if uh, you'd like to, but just wanna say thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, um, we're gonna move to uh, comments. On, no, we, we've closed public comments. So we're gonna go to public comments on non-agenda items. So if, you, if, you, if you're about to talk on the item that we just had, that is, okay, all right, go ahead. I'm here to speak about the improvements that Newport Mesa Unified School District is proposing to Ensign School. And I, I don't know if any staff or, and I'll notice that Ara's leaving right now. I think you'd wanna stay for this. I don't know if any of our council members or any of the staff have met with any of the trustees of the Newport Mesa Unified School District or with Ara. Yeah, everyone who's met with somebody from the school district, raise your hand. That's not how this public comment section works. That's all right. Works. So I've met with three of them, Bartow, Yelsey, and Fleur, and walked it with Mike Zinacori to understand what they're specifically proposing. The parking lot on Irvine goes from Beacon to uh, Coral, and the bike cage goes away, and the building, which is just recently demolished. There'll be a new bike cage further in the blacktop area from that. They initially proposed a single point of entry. They think it's safer, and they can certainly monitor who comes on and off campus, but it also puts all of the car drop off, the pedestrian, and all the bikes at a single gate. So we pointed that out to these trustees because we don't think you wanna put all those things together in a funnel, and having that up on Cliff Drive didn't make sense either. It works very well right now when people can come in, bikes and pedestrians at two different places in the back of the field. They were sympathetic with that. They're being, they bought into, the school district was bought into the idea that a single point of entry is the best security, which is true if you had a concrete wall around it. But when you have an open fence, you know, a shooter could shoot through the fence anywhere around the campus. Obviously that controls entrance and access in and out of it, and that works during the school day. When I spoke today to Bartow, she said that the current plan, unlike what Ara just suggested, that the current plan is not to do the banana lot on cliff because that really doesn't get them anything. It does take out all the trees. It's only for drop off and pick up in the morning and afternoon of students, which really doesn't create a problem out on cliff. Yes, they double park there, but making the banana lot doesn't really change the congestion and number of cars. Bartow indicated that the sense of the board was that they wanted to maintain the entrance gate off of Irvine Avenue at uh, Beacon, that that was helpful. I think the most significant thing to me personally, besides thinking of changing all these patterns, which the school district can change at any one of these three schools where the entrance and exits are, but to me personally, was that you no longer have access to the fields of New Barber High School, and I get that there's a big investment that's been made there and they wanna keep it and maintain it so it's secure and safe, but they've also closed off access to the fields at the grammar school, and with these improvements, the fencing around the school is higher, and it will be locked off from any neighborhood access. So the Newport Heights area and that area, Costa Mesa, has no public fields for kids to go play on after school on the weekend. So where kids used to play a pickup game of baseball or you know, frisbee or, or whatever on a weekend, they can't have access to those fields. Now, what, again, what Bartow told me was that there's a card access system that would be available for sports leagues. So AYSO, baseball, <laughs> football, some organizer would have a card key that would get them in is the idea. I don't know if it'll actually happen, but it would, what I'd like to see is the city, like they've done in some other instances with the school district, is have a system in place where a parks and rec person on a Saturday when there's not organized games can open the fields up and then close them down at the end of the day. All Otherwise, right. we lose all our parks. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please, on non-agenda items. Since I'm here, I am still Peter Boyd and I still live on Santa Ana. I'm just wanting to put a plug in for the literacy project that the city does through the library. I'm a tutor there. Uh, I'm not asking for a proclamation or a photo with you, Mayor O'Neill. <laughs> but uh, that is a really great resource. It's been really rewarding for me to help somebody. My, the 2T I work with is a 69-year-old man who reads at basically a kindergarten level. And I've been working with him for about the last year. 
I just think it's a really great thing for us to support as a city to improve uh, our fellow citizens. So thanks for your support of the library and the Literacy Project. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. <coughs> okay. All right. So um, we don't have closed session tonight. Uh, we do have a, a regular meeting that starts at 7 o'clock. Uh, we will have a, a remembrance of those people in Newport Beach community that uh, we lost on Sunday at the beginning of our meeting. So we'll stand adjourned until then. Thank you. Welcome to Newport Beach. Uh, we are going to start the regular meeting at 7 o'clock for January 28th, 2020. <laughs> Madam Clerk, roll call, please. The record will reflect that all members of council are present. Thank you. Uh, so as mayor, I'm able to move the agenda items around just a bit. Uh, I'm going to be moving a portion of the city council announcements up directly behind the, behind the Pledge of Allegiance uh, for a special remembrance of those who passed on Sunday. We'll take a break after that remembrance and then come back to move through our regular agenda, which will include normal council announcements. So please stand with us as we have the invocation by Reverend uh, Mary Cyphers and remain standing afterward for the Pledge of Allegiance led by council member Diane Dixon. Will you join me for a moment of centering? Spirit of life and love, we thank you for the holy presence that you bring to our world, the gift of life that flows through each of us and that reminds us each moment is a gift. I ask that you bless and guide our council members as they continue to bless and guide our community and that you guide each of us who are citizens of this community that we might truly live this gift of life to the fullest to be blessings, to be gifts, so that all might know this precious gift we call life. In your holy and loving name we pray, amen. If you'd please join me in Pledge of Allegiance to our great nation, please place your hand on your heart. Let's begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag. Ladies and gentlemen, our city is in mourning. Grief and despair have engulfed our tight-knit community because we lost eight community members on Sunday. Three families in our community lost mothers and daughters, two families lost fathers, and we lost neighbors and friends. Our city council could not start tonight any other way than by remembering each one of these well-loved men, women, and young ladies 
Each one of us will read passages, and at the end, I'll ask for a moment of silence. <coughs> Mayor Pro Tem Avery. John Altobelli. Few in our community have had such positive and lasting impacts as John Altobelli, a devoted husband, father, and beloved baseball coach. As the longest tenured baseball coach in Orange Coast College history, John was a leader and mentor to generations of young athletes. In a career lasting nearly three decades, he led the OCC Pirates to four state community college championships and more than 700 wins. In 2019, he received the prestigious honor of being named coach, National Coach of the Year by the American Baseball Coaches Association. John was also a wonderful husband and father. His wife and children spent years on the baseball field at Orange Coast College, uh, attending games and uh, being a part of it. And he really had the pleasure of wrapping his family into his career. And uh, it's, um, it's mighty sad. He is survived by his son, JJ, and his daughter, Alexis. The, the tribute to Carrie is different because Carrie was foremost a mom, and it was actually hard for us to find information about her. So this was written by one of Carrie's loving mom friends. She said, typical of many moms, the accomplishments of Carrie Antebelli are not found in a resume about herself. They are found in the accomplishments of her family, which was everything to her. Her husband and children always came first. She was loyal to the core. Just as she was a devoted wife and mom, she was a devoted friend. You didn't have to ask for her help. She was already at your doorstep before you could even call or text her. Carrie never took no for an answer. She volunteered at her daughter's schools. She supported her husband at all his baseball events. She could have played Wonder Woman with her beauty, poise, and organizational skills to get any job done. Carrie enjoyed the surf and sand. An ideal day would be with her family at home or at the beach or really anywhere that they were all just together. Her children, JJ and Lexi, are surrounded by family and loving friends. And as my daughter said, who is one of her best friends, my daughter's lived in Newport her whole life, and she said, I've never been mo more proud of the Newport Beach community. They have come together with offers of everything that could possibly be imagined. And someone came to my door today and gave me a card with $350 gift certificates for the kids and didn't want their name to be used, just wanted me to give that to them, and also had signed up on the GoFundMe pages. So our community is devastated, but they are filled with love. <clears throat> Elisa Altabelli. Elisa Altabelli may not have followed her father into baseball, but she definitely shared his passion for sports. Her love was basketball, and she was a standout among her Mamba's teammates. Elisa was an eighth grader at Ensign Intermediate School and previously attended Mariners Elementary. The principal at Mariners remembers her as an incredible all-around person, a friend to so many because of her kind heart and positive nature, an amazing competitor, a very talented athlete, but also extremely humble. There will be a memorial for Elisa at 5 p.m. Thursday at Mariners Park, and she is survived by her sister, Alexis, and brother, JJ. Kobe Bryant. Much has been written and said about the incredible achievements of the leg legendary sports icon, Kobe Bryant. Five NBA titles, two Olympic gold medals, 18 all-star appearances, and one MVP award in a storied 20-year career with the Los Angeles Lakers. But he was something more to, to those of us in Newport Beach. He was part of our community, a devoted father, husband, friend, neighbor, and mentor. He was deeply involved in our local schools and in youth sports. Kobe was always striving for success in everything he did, a champion and inspiration on and off the court. 
He is survived by his wife, Vanessa, and daughters, Natalia, Bianca, and Capri. Yana Bryant. <clears throat> At age 13, <clears throat> Gigi Bryant had just started to grow into potential as a basketball player. It is being reported that her father said of her athletic ability, she's better than I was at her age. She had dreams of playing basketball for the University of Connecticut and, professional and professionally in the WNBA. She was a determined competitor and leader with talent and a work ethic that served as inspiration to many young athletes. Even more important than her athletic ability, she was a light to those who knew her. A star student at Harvard Day School she was remembered this week as always smiling, a strong leader, the level of maturity beyond her years. She was survived by her mother, Vanessa, and sisters, Natalia, Bianca, and Capri. A special prayer goes out to you four. There's no greater pain than the loss of a child and sibling. Thank the Lord Jesus that she was at church with her father earlier that morning. And like a light that never dims, She'll be with the Heavenly Father for eternity, and we will see her again. To our friends, classmates, and the younger members of our community, I have this message for you. Do not despair or be afraid. Everything is in God's hands, even the ball. Sarah, Sarah <coughs> Chester. Sarah Chester was a devoted wife, mother, and active volunteer in her children's school communities, first at Harborview Elementary and then most recently at St. Margaret's Episcopal School in San Juan Capistrano. She was a teacher at Tustin Memorial Academy before leaving education to spend more time raising her family. In high school, she was a standout soccer player. She is described by her brother Andy as one that everybody counted on, strong, kind, intelligent, funny, beautiful, and was everything to us. Sarah is survived by her husband Chris and sons Hayden and Riley. Sarah is was also the niece of close college friends of mine, my husband, USC football great Bob Chandler. Bob Chandler died 25 years ago on Sunday, the same day that Sarah died, 25 years later. And they were both at a very young age. She was, I think Sarah was 38 and Bob was 41, and tragic loss of two people in this family that I've known for 50 years at such a young age. She was a remarkable woman. And 13-year-old Peyton Chester, a smile and personality that would light any room, is how her family described Peyton. Peyton had a passion for basketball and dreamed of one day playing for a college team and then professionally she attended Harborview Elementary in our community from kindergarten through fifth grade. Her former principal at Harborview recalls Peyton as one of those kids that everyone was drawn to because she was so genuinely kind. She went out of her way to make sure people felt comfortable. And as been mentioned already, Peyton is survived by her father, Chris, and brothers, Hayden and Riley. Christina Mauser was a loving wife, mother, teacher, coach, and athlete with a passion for youth sports. She was a teacher and coach at Harbor Day School for 11 years before joining the Mamba Sports Academy as the top assistant coach and defensive specialist with a coaching style her players described as competitive, positive, and encouraging. At Harbor Day School, she helped lead the eighth grade girls team to their first championship. Many of us also knew her as the manager of her husband's band, the Tijuana Dogs. She is survived by her husband, Matt, and three children, Penny, Tom, and Ivy. We also express our sympathy to the Zobayan family and our neighbors in Huntington Beach who lost two residents. Please join us in a moment of silence. We thank you, and um, we're going we're gonna to take a five-minute break. Um, so uh, we'll we'll get the meeting started in about five minutes. Thank you.
Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, notice to the public, please. The city provides a yellow sign-in card to assist in the preparation of the minutes. The completion of the card is not required in order to address the city council. If the optional sign-in card has been completed, it should be placed in the box provided at the podium. The city council of Newport Beach welcomes and encourages community participation. Public comments are generally limited to three minutes per person to allow everyone to speak. Written comments are encouraged as well. The city council has, has the discretion to extend or shorten the time limit on agenda or non-agenda items. As a courtesy, please turn cell phones off or set them in the silent mode. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll now go into uh, city council announcements and oral reports from city council <laughs> on committee activities. As a reminder to my colleagues, if you could please limit it to five. If you cannot do so, we will bring it back at the end of the meeting. All right, Mr. Herdman. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, we've, we have, when I say we, I'm talking about city staff and myself have finished two informational town hall meetings on Balboa Island regarding future infrastructure projects, very well attended. And I feel like most island residents are very well educated now about these future projects. Uh, attended CDMRA residents association meeting, chamber government affairs meeting. Uh, we have, uh, reorganized the and repurposed the city's aviation committee. And uh, I've attended uh, all of the subcommittee meetings in addition to last night's aviation committee meeting. And then I think the other two will be covered probably by other council members. Thank that you, was five, Mayor. <laughs> You're getting good at it. All right, uh, Ms. Dixon. Yes. Um, just to a couple of announcements. I, re I returned this afternoon after being in Sacramento yesterday and today, attending on behalf of the city, uh, the ACCOC, Associated California Cities of Orange County, uh, two full days of meetings with uh, legislators and key staff. Just a couple of highlights. Uh, met uh, with the, a senior director, not the director, but the senior director of housing and community development. And I was with about representatives of about 25 other Orange County cities, so we're all on the same page as far as what we're all dealing with, all the cities are dealing with as far as RENA, as we know, the, and the affordable housing and the new laws that were assigned, new legislation that was signed into laws relating to land use and zoning, SB 330. And then the bill of Senator Weiner of San Francisco that is a current session bill that is going to be voted on the floor of the Senate tomorrow, SB 50, which will have impacts on all cities. Anyway, she heard an earful from all of the city representatives of, of the burdens. This is the point I made. Uh, first of all, we have uh, advocated in a letter to the state to delay the implementation of the housing element or the due date, which is currently set at October 2020, 2021, and we'd like it delayed. And she interestingly said, oh, no one's ever asked about that. So I made that clear that that's important. I also emphasized the burden that all city staffs are under in community development and planning, just dealing with the compliance issues on these new laws. She says no one's ever complained about that. Um, she also said there's money available uh, in state grants to assist. I said we can't get a consultant because they're so busy. And she said, oh, there's planning staff available at the state level to help cities with their planning apply for a grant. And so I was texting Mr. Jurgis during this meeting, and I said, did we apply for a state grant? And he said, yes, we did. <laughs> so that's good. Um, and then uh, we met with Senator Morlock, and during the senator's presentation, there was a rally forming on the Capitol steps, no on AB5. So there are efforts to either repeal or significantly amend AB5, which is the independent contracting law. That was just took effect. Uh, announcement, I will be having a District 1 town hall on Monday, February 3rd. One of the key items is the snowy plover matter that affects the oceanfront issues on uh, the peninsula. And so I urge all residents, especially from that part of the peninsula, to be attending. So 6.30 p.m. at Marina Park. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Muldoon. Thank you. Ms. Brenner. Um, I attended the Doris Kearns Goodwin lecture at part of the Witty Lecture Series, and it was 
standing room only and they had a waiting list and she was lecturing two different times in our city. It was so well attended. Several people said to me, gee, too bad we don't have a lecture hall so we could actually see better and hear better. So that was interesting. I also attended the OC Forum State of the County where Lisa Bartlett spoke and uh, the two authors of the Chapman study on housing were there, the ones that disagree with the um, other economists who say we need to have so many additional housing units. So that was interesting. And tomorrow evening we have a community conversation on mental health here in the council chambers. And um, this came about as a result of some of our task force members recognizing that on the homeless issue, so many people are concerned about the drug addicted and the mentally ill, and so our committee suggested that we put together an information evening to find out what the state's doing about that and um, get some other, we have a panel of speakers, and so that'll be six o'clock tomorrow evening. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Duffield. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor. So uh, I went to uh, Washington, D.C. last week with Scott Cunningham, who's on the Harbor Commission, and <coughs> my fellow councilman, Brad Avery, this is my fourth trip there, and we made it just in time for the first day of the impeachment. <laughs> so that was fun. Um, so just a quick update after four years of going there and uh, wandering around begging for this money to dredge our harbor, uh, we have finally, I think, broken through and are talking to the right people, getting answers we like to hear, but it's still an ongoing process that will continue to need nourishing and work, and um, we're very um, on the positive side of this. It's a $23 million ask, of which um, may come in two, uh, two, two payments, but uh, that's, we're uh, encouraged that it's looking positive that we may uh, be dredging soon. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Avery. Um, uh, representing the city and uh, Mayor O'Neill, I attended the uh, National Association of Mayors in Washington, D.C., and I flew out with uh, Harbor Commissioner Cunningham and Councilmember Duffield. And uh, when I wasn't uh, in some of the sessions, um, I was trying to help as much as I could uh, represent the city along with uh, Duffy and Scott uh, at a meeting. Um, at the Eisenhower building next to the White House with uh, some aides, President, President Trump's, uh, and uh, representation from the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, so I, I can just say that a national mayor's meeting was, was a, an adult portion. There was a lot going on. There was mayors from big cities and uh, small cities and uh, their, their struggles and uh, their complexities it, uh, all of it made me appreciate uh, Newport Beach. And uh, so um, <laughs> we're an exceptional city in many ways. And, it, and, and a lot of times it, in that crowd, it, uh, you know, it doesn't pay to bring it up, actually. Some of the things <laughs> go on and are, are good fortune. And we should be, always keep that in mind. Um, and the on, only thing I, else I want to say is, um, Harbor Commissioner Cunningham and Duffy are really something on this dredging issue. I should also say that our Public Works Department uh, with Dave Webb and uh, Chris Miller, uh, we've, it's a solid team and uh, the city was well represented in Washington, D.C. It has been, continues to be, I think it's gotten better. And uh, Duffy's passion for doing this and Scott is an absolute tiger going after this. And uh, so I believe we will get the harbor dredged and uh, the, the federal government, I think, is willing to help us out because um, I think I can't imagine another city working harder on an initiative like this than we've done. Thank you. Thank you. So I was able to attend with uh, Councilmember Herdman the Muth Center uh, Volunteer Day uh, where they, uh, they were able to pull out 125 bags of trash um, out of the uh, back bay, which that was fantastic. Thank you for doing that. Um, 
the uh, City of Hope is now in Newport Beach. Uh, so I attended with a lot with the majority of our council, uh, their ribbon cutting. Uh, that would be a phenomenal addition to our health care services offered in Newport Beach. Uh, well, uh, the reason I, I want to say thank you to uh, Mayor Pro Tem Avery for attending the mayor's conference. Uh, instead of <laughs> going there, I went up to CalPERS for a um, stakeholder meeting with uh, Council Member Dixon and uh, our finance director. I will be honest, I did not come away optimistic, uh, but I was glad to be there. Uh, then 10, uh, 10 young men were awarded their Eagle Scouts badge this past weekend, and uh, I was pleased to be a part of that. A couple notes on vigils. Um, our community is holding them. Um, I attended one in Newport Coast, and I attended one at uh, Harbor Day yesterday. And then, as Councilmember Duffield mentioned, um, on Thursday there's going to be um, there's going to be another one for Alyssa Altabelli um, at five o'clock. And uh, I just want to say to everyone who's organizing those, thank you for doing that. Um, it's a really, it is a great community-led effort that's happening for uh, for everyone we lost. So I, I just want to say thank you. Um, and then real quick, Wednesday, the uh, CERT Award, tomorrow night, there are the CERT Awards. And then Friday, there's the uh, Christmas Boat Parade Awards. So with that, um, public comments on consent calendar, Madam Clerk. This is the time in which council members may pull items from the consent calendar for discussion. Those are items 1 through 15. Public comments are also invited on consent calendar items. Speakers must limit comments to three minutes. Before speaking, please state your name for the record. If any item is removed from the consent calendar by a council member, members of the public are invited to speak on each item for up to three minutes per item. All matters listed under consent calendar are considered to be routine and will all be enacted by one motion in the form listed below. Council members have received detailed staff reports on each of the items recommending an action. There will be no separate discussion of these items prior to the, to the time the City Council votes on the motion unless members of the City Council request specific items to be discussed and are removed from the consent calendar for separate action. All right. Are there any items uh, you'd like to pull from consent calendar? Mr. Herdman? None. <coughs> None. Ms. Dixon? None. Thank you. Mr. Muldoon? No, I'd like to lodge a no vote on item 8. Okay. Ms. Brenner? No. Mr. Duffield. I also would like the no vote on eight. Um, Mr. Uh, or Mayor Pro Tem uh, Avery. None. All right, and I have none. Um, given that we don't have any to poll, uh, we'll invite public comments on the items for the uh, consent calendar. And uh, Mr. Tanner approached me beforehand. Just everyone know, understand, he's going to have an extra minute. Um, his his topic's going to be to uh, the arena allocation issue and uh, the exception to prove the rule. I'm giving someone extra time. Anyway, all right. Go ahead, Mr. Thank Tanner. you, David Tanner. Uh, I'd like first to start out by commending the city for its efforts on the Shake Alert West Coast early uh, earthquake early warning system and its steps that it's taken to implement this. This is a really big deal uh, for the safety of the citizens of Newport Beach and the effectiveness of our emergency responders. Uh, there was a presentation given on December 17th. It's on the city's website. Uh, this program has been in development since the 1980s uh, with federal state agencies, uh, universities, Caltech, uh, University of Oregon, University of Washington, uh, <coughs> UC Berkeley. This is a really big deal, and I commend the city for taking the action that they have. So what I wanted to talk about tonight is what this video presentation provided in the way of information that is important to the city. And I'm going to summarize what's in this video, uh, and I'm going to summarize the summary that I wrote so that I don't take up much time. Uh, in the video, the pre presenter, Margaret Mancini from Caltech, uh, talked about the big one, the big earthquake. It's a seven-plus magnitude earthquake. And she said that those occur on average about 100 and every 150 years. The last large one was in 1857. That means that the next one on average is forecasted to occur in 2007. So we're overdue. Uh, what she also said uh, was that uh, the USGS, Geologic, uh, United States Geological Survey, uh, 
forecasted a 99% chance of a magnitude 6.7 earthquake in Southern California in the next 30 years and a 75% likelihood of a magnitude 7.0 or greater uh, in Southern California in the next 30 years. She went on to state that earthquakes, uh, the severity of the earthquakes have many factors, one of which, which is important, is the soil, the underlying ground, and in particular, the sedimentary formations that underlie the LA Basin, Orange County, Newport Beach. Uh, and she said that uh, because of those sedimentary locations, the liquefaction potential, the settling potential from ground shaking is high in those areas, in the valleys with, within Southern California with sedimentary uh, deposits in them. So she went on to say, and I think this is, we all know this, but it, uh, it's not my words, it's, it's the federal government, the state government saying this, what are the effects? And this is current with current building permits from the big one, what's gonna happen to us? She said widespread damage affecting eight counties in Southern California, $213 billion in damages, 300,000 buildings significantly damaged and widespread infrastructure damage, 270,000 displaced persons, 50,000 injuries, water, electricity, gas, telephone services, interruption, emergency responders overwhelmed, 18 month recovery period anticipated along with an economic shock to our businesses. So I have some recommendations I'd like to make to the city. Uh, first, if you haven't already, please watch this video. Hear it for yourself so you don't take my word for it. Increase public awareness. I think the public needs to know. They need to know what the city is doing, great steps it's taking, uh, what, uh, what they should be doing also. Consider these forecasts in the general plan update. Provide SCAG additional information identifying the city's liquefaction, earthquake hazards. Share this video with SCAG and elected officials involved in housing stimulus legislation. Request an offer to coordinate a presentation by Margaret Vincenti to SCAG and state legislatures prior to SCAG's arena allocation. Let them hear this for themselves and ask questions. All right, wrap it up quickly. Ms. Thank you. I'm okay. gonna wrap this up. Uh, we do not build high density housing at the base of unstable <coughs> hillsides, identified landslides or avalanche hazard areas. Of course not. So why is our state legislature, man, legislature mandating we build significant new housing and high liquefaction hazard areas subject to catastrophic effects in the event of a large earthquake? There is a, an apparent conflict. It appears housing stimulus laws, which are of statewide importance, are paramount to public health and safety. I'm asking the city to consider if the legislature has followed the law in enacting housing stimulus laws and if an amendment or modification to these laws is not warranted. <coughs> thank you. All right, thank you. All right, on the uh, consent calendar items, next speaker, please. <coughs> Good evening, uh, Mayor O'Neill and members of the City Council. Uh, my name is Bruce Bartram and I'm speaking on behalf of still protecting our new port, uh, Spawn. I'm the president of Spawn and I'm addressing item, consent item number seven, the RENA allocation resolution. First of all, we'd like to thank you for tackling the housing issue. Uh, we appreciate that you are working with other cities and have followed suit with tonight's resolution and letters from the city uh, in sending you our resolution with endorsements we wanted to accomplish several things in preparing the resolution we wanted to raise awareness of our members and the general public concerning the housing issue that is facing the city and we wanted to express our wish to work with the city so we can resolve and hopefully reach reasonable housing numbers and express our wish 
to reach a consensus regarding the ultimate general plan housing element. Also in our resolution, we wanted to express the hope that in addressing the housing crisis, we not lose the goals of our general plan policies and goals already in place. Mentioned twice in our resolution is the goal of preserving Banning Ranch as open space. It is our hope that that goal isn't lost in addressing the housing crisis. Uh, this because the Banning Ranch Conservancy appears to be close to achieving success. Uh, we all should be aware of that the Conservancy recently uh, received a donation in the sum of $50 million towards the purchase of the property as open space. That is a tremendous achievement and the city should keep that in mind in trying to address this housing issue. With that, uh, we'd like to thank you for your hard work in addressing the housing issue and it is our hope that we can work with you and resolve this issue uh, to the uh, benefit of uh, our whole community. Thanks again for your efforts. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council. My name is Phil Greer, and I'm going to do my broken record routine on um, consent item number four, which is the lobbyist registration. Um, I've attended all of the um, public meetings that you have held, and I have to say that Mr. O'Neill, Mr. Avery, and Ms. Brenner, you've done a remarkable job in bringing out the people, getting input, and doing the things necessary to open up a dialogue and a conversation. And the same goes for Aaron Harp. I, I think he's been very open about how this process might work, and it is a difficult process. Um, my issues are the same issues that we've had from day one on this, and there, there are two. One is the lobbyist registration and how you comport that with um, certain requirements that I have, that Mr. O'Neill has, Mr. Muldoon has, as attorneys in dealing with the confidentiality and fiduciary obligations we have to our clients. And I think there needs to be something in there to, to deal with that, and I hate to use the word, but I think you're gonna ultimately have to exempt attorneys from this process simply because to not do that is gonna cause us to have a fiduciary issue and we're obviously gonna stand on the side of the law and our, our bar obligations and we're gonna be in litigation and I think you guys will lose. Um, and I don't wanna do that, I don't think anybody else here does. I think we all go to court and we all announce who we represent. But I think when you get into the issues of how much somebody's paying, what the deal is, et cetera, et cetera, then you're going into that attorney client issue and I think that is problematic. Um, so I'd urge you to take a look at that part of it the second thing I would ask you to take a look at is the enforcement provisions. Again, the problem is that there aren't any enforcement provisions, and the ones that do exist are relatively weak. And unless you give an independent third party, be it the city attorney or a special committee or an outside independent counsel, the opportunity to prosecute violators, all you're gonna have is a continuing uh, system of people violating, saying, oh my gosh, I made a mistake, fixing it and going on. So there needs to be some sort of an enforcement provision. But again, I commend the council for, for taking the first steps and, and really appreciate the hard work you guys are doing. Thank you. Next speaker, please. All right, seeing none, we'll bring it back. Um, <coughs> Mr. Avery, do we have a, uh, a motion? Okay, Mr. Mayor, I move the balance of the consent calendar items one through 15 uh, with the exception, uh, uh, or at least registering a no vote, uh, council member Muldoon on item eight and council member Duff Duffield also on item eight. There are also two amendments to last, the last council meetings minutes of January 14th. And these are items one and three. Sorry, just a moment. The, we have, we have amendments to item number three. Oh, the uh, ordinance. Got it. Okay, okay, thank you. Sorry, I misunderstood right. that. Do we have a second? second? All right, second by Councilmember Muldoon. Let's vote. My, my screen doesn't work again. Just, I can't are you voting it. yes? I went to sleep. <laughs> okay. 
and prior to, go, yeah, just go ahead and tap it. And prior to reading the votes, sorry, I have a lot of ordinances to read. Um, wait, let me get you guys started. Ordinance number 2020-3, or two, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach amending chapter 14.12 of title 14 of the Newport Beach Municipal Code relating to water service discontinuation for non-payment. Ordinance number 2020-3, let's see, ordinance of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach amending section 1.12.020 subsection J and adding chapter 1.28 to title one of the Newport Beach Municipal Code to increase transparency in government operations and establish lobbyist registration reporting disclosure requirements. Ordinance, ordinance number 2020-1, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach amending sections chapter Amending sections of Chapter 12.24 of the Newport Beach Municipal Code regarding increasing and decreasing state speed limits. Councilmember Brenner, are you a thumbs up? I will assist you in a moment. Are you thumbs up? Okay. Motion carries unanimously 7-0. Oh, uh, technology. All right. So we'll move on to public comments on uh, non-agenda items. Do we have any public comments on non-agenda items? Hang, hang on, we need to get live streamed here. Okay. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor, uh, Council. Um, my name is Dennis Bress, uh, Balboa Island. A uh, couple of things. One um, was at the Aviation Committee meeting uh, run by uh, Council Member Jeff Herdman last night, doing a great job. Uh, we're really making progress, uh, especially the way Jeff has uh, broken things down into subcommittees, and the subcommittees are broken out to do very specific things, and they're doing wonderful work. Uh, one thing I want to make the request for is uh, we're over in the next building. If we could uh, turn on the streaming uh, in order to stream live uh, that work that's being done there, uh, and then record it so that we could put it on the uh, city's website. Uh, not a lot of people can make all the meetings, but this airport work is very important. So I think it would uh, uh, help with our new person, that's our public information uh, manager, John Pope, kind of fall within his wheelhouse to be able to have more uh, input uh, going out to the citizens uh, to see what's going on. So if we could turn on the streaming and record it and post it on the website for aviation committee meetings. Second point is, uh, I would make the request to the city council to request to officially from the city of Newport Beach to the board of supervisors. Uh, you've heard this before for a feasibility study. Um, this kind of ties into transportation in order to figure out how we might interconnect John Wayne Airport to Anaheim Arctic Transportation Center and then from Anaheim Arctic out to Ontario with the point to be able to uh, have an option now, uh, knowing that John Wayne Airport and the growth of John Wayne based on just population uh, is going to increase. We had about 10.6 million uh, passengers go through John Wayne in 2019. So other point is uh, we're doing the uh, OC streetcar, which is a four mile project above ground uh, in Santa Ana. And that's $408 million for four miles. So it's 100 million a mile. Uh, the city of Santa Ana and the mayor of Santa Ana is basically moving uh, as a city to want to uh, expand upon that system. They want to uh, connect from the terminus on Harbor Boulevard and Costa Mesa 11 miles up to Disneyland and on Bristol six miles down to John Wayne. And I think this kind of follows into the arena plan too, uh, that we could do some high density numbers. Uh, the millennials, uh, young people that are working, don't necessarily want to uh, have single family homes, but uh, in LA, they're doing tremendous work on this communal living type configuration where you live in a building and you have your own room. They have communal kitchen, they have a gym, all the amenities, and they're not lonely. Everybody's together having a good time. So maybe that's something that if we connected Rena and our ability to meet those numbers in and around the airport, uh, these people don't necessarily want cars either at younger age, um, so they could connect to this mass, mass transit terminus that could get them up to Anaheim and then from Anaheim uh, up to uh, Ontario. So uh, those are the two things, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please.
Hi, good evening, uh, honorable council members. My name is Ryan Reza Farsai. First off, my condolences to the Bryant, Altabelli, Mauser, Chester, Zobayan families and extended families. My heart goes out especially to the three children that were on board of that helicopter, Gianna, Alyssa, and Peyton. It was a tragic event on Sunday morning in the city of Los Angeles, Newport Beach, and Philadelphia lost one of its greatest. I am a 20-year season ticket holder to the Lakers, and I'm thankful for the NBA and the Clippers organization for postponing tonight's game at the request of the Lakers organization and the Bus family. Uh, I'm here tonight because I do not need to be at a Los Angeles or a Staples Center for a 7.37 p.m. tip-off. I'm not Muslim, I'm not Jewish, I'm not Christian, I'm not Catholic, I'm not Buddhist, I'm not Hindu. What I am is all of them. That is my self-realization for the last few several years. I'm now 45 years old and three years of doing daily yoga and 20 years as a practitioner and 18 years as a teacher of yoga and Eastern philosophy. And we always say in Eastern philosophy, you're not in charge, the bookie of souls is in charge. The unbribable judge, he's in charge. He's in charge of your first, middle, and last breath, first, middle, and last heartbeat. So you should learn to be thankful for your life and do the best you can. Tonight I'm here to talk about life and what it is the meaning of life and pr as perceived by this Trojan Yogi Father, the lineage of kings and prophets and gurus and the follower of Lord Christ. The meaning of life is to make the world a better place for our children and our children's children. Even if you do not have any children, this must be your focus. How do we do that? First, we've got to take care of ourselves. According to one Deepak Chopra, you need five things to have a good life. You need to eat well. You need to sleep well. You need to have regular exercise. You should have regular massage and a regular chiropractic. I would say if you did daily yoga, you don't need regular chiropractic, and your health will steadily improve, and your knees will last beyond your 80s, 90s, or 100s. Your mind, body, soul, and spirit, and your heart will be under your control. There are two types of people in this world, those that are in control of their body and their health, and those that are at the mercy of their body and their health. The number one lesson you can give your children is to steadily improve their health in their lifetime. Without good health, you're no good to yourself, your family, or your friends, or society as a whole. Bettering the world is working for our children by proper conduct, proper speech, proper behavior, proper thoughts. Your children watch and learn from your actions and your words. So make sure you say good words to them. Always give them positive feedback. Do not put them down. Do not discourage them for whatever they want to do. And let them do what they want to do in life. Do not be an obstacle for their goals and their dreams. So that's my two cents for you guys. And uh, thankful again for the bus family to step up and do something that has never been done before to postpone a game. <laughs> and uh, thank you and God bless America. Thank you. Next speaker, please, on non-agenda items. Okay, seeing none, we'll move into the public hearing on item number 16. Um, <coughs> unless someone would like a full staff report, I think we could focus in on a couple of things. The one that I would suggest is talking about the difference between 500 and 750 square feet, and the other would be um, to address some of the questions that uh, um, Mr. Tanner had sent in that I thought might be worth uh, discussing just a bit. Anyone, w anyone want more than that? Okay, thanks, let's start with that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor um, and City Council. Simone Georges, the Community Development Director. With me, I have Jaime Murillo. He's a principal planner that's worked on this project. Um, you know, we've, the City Council initiated the Cottage Preservation Ordinance back in May, and we've been spending a, a lot of time working with the community to try to get this preservation ordinance um, correct. The, this preservation ordinance is it's a volunteer uh, ordinance. Property owners don't have to comply with this preservation ordinance. It is created simply to allow families or property owners to expand their property up, up to 500 square feet without complying with the parking requirements. And it is strictly voluntary. That's why we did it. The whole purpose is to preserve those beach cottages. If a property owner wants, uh, decides to take that beach cottage and tear it down, that's up to them and they have every right as a property owner, as a property right to rebuild that structure. Again, this is a voluntary program. Um, we wanna talk about the, um, the, um, how we came up with the 500 square feet. 
originally when we went to the Planning Commission, we had actually a provision of up to 50% of the existing structure. The feedback we got was that potentially you could have dwellings to be very large. If somebody wants to take advantage of that 50% rule, if you had an existing cottage, which was say 2,000 square feet, and you expand it 50%, you can have a cottage up to 3,000 square feet. And that was going to create a large structure. So we got some negative feedback from the community. Um, the, the Planning Commission came to us, uh, when we presented to the Planning Commission, they said that we need a little bit more certain caps on the limits and sizes of these dwelling units as far as regard with our ordinance. The 500 square feet that we've come up with and proposed to the Planning Commission, it was done at an internal staff level. And what we've just decided upon is what is a reasonable amount to expand a beach cottage where you could expand maybe up to two bedrooms and a little bit of square footage. You know, a bedroom is typically 150 square feet, maybe up to 200 square feet. So that's how we came up with the 500 square feet. There are some members of the community that went to the Planning Commission and said, you know, we love this ordinance, but we'd like to push it up from 500 up to 750 square feet. The Planning Commission didn't direct staff to change our resolutions. They didn't change anything. They just said, go ahead and just share that with the City Council and see what the City Council wanted, wants to do with it. From a staff standpoint, we came up with 500. We thought it was a reasonable number because we had some comments from the community about the size getting too big. If the council decides to push it up to, five, to 750 square feet, there's no negative impacts of doing that at all. So that's kind of how we came up with the 500 square feet. Um, Jaime's here. He can answer any additional questions that you may have. Um, and with regards to AB, if we can put up on the screen. Let's, I'll tell you what, just, just a second. Let's just stop on that okay. discrete item. Council, do you have any questions on? No. Okay. All right. Let's go to the next one. And there's been a question about how does the ADB, ADU provision um, come into play, and, and I'm going to have Jaime go ahead and answer that. Um, we have a slide up on the screen. We have the, the, we have a provision of um, the state law AB 881. Thank you, Simone. Uh, good evening, Mayor, members of the council. Um, yeah. So uh, the question was posed: Will this cottage preservation ordinance uh, possibly lead to the ability to be converted into accessory dwelling units? And as you heard at the meeting, uh, the last meeting. Uh, the state has removed a lot of the barriers and restrictions that cities can place on property owners to develop accessory dwelling units. Um, we don't think that the, this cottage preservation ordinance will open up the door to more accessory dwelling units. Um, compliance or in order for a property owner to take advantage of this incentive, they're going to have to agree to uh, restrict their property to a certain building form and building envelope preserving the character of that property and they're subject to that 500 square foot cap. Uh, however, a, the accessory dwelling unit law would allow uh, property owner to kind of go beyond what we're proposing through this incentive, and there's the ability for a property owner to actually develop up to a thousand square foot uh, accessory dwelling unit without providing any additional parking. Um, so the law is actually more permissive as it pertains to accessory dwelling units uh, than what the cottage preservation ordinance would allow. Uh, you know, I realized uh, we should probably also just uh, let me ask council council. Do you have any um, questions specific to this second item? Okay, uh, a third item the Planning Commission asked us to ask staff to bring to us was a question of uh, requiring an in-lieu parking fee. Do you have any questions on that? All right, seeing none. Um, any other questions for staff on this item? Okay, we'll go out to public comment. Do we have public comment on this item? Good evening again, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. My name is Charles Klobe. Um, first of all, I want to thank Simone and Jaime for pushing this along for the time it's taken. I've been to every public outreach meeting, every planning commission meeting regarding this. I completely support it, and I agree with increasing the square footage to 750. I, I, I think this is a great incentive to get people in cottages to remodel instead of scraping. So I completely support this. Thank you. Thank you. Any? All right. Council, Mayor Dennis Bress, Balbo Island. Um, I concur with um, the 750. Um, I'm just uh, getting up to speed on this, but had a conversation um, in regards to the uh, Balbo Island Preservation Association on Balbo Island, and um, this is a good deal. Uh, basically what it's gonna do is 
uh, allow people that own cottages to have an option to expand. And if we go up to the 750, I think that's going to make a big difference um, for people taking that direction uh, because that could give them almost, based on 200 square feet, close to over three bedrooms at that particular point. So um, I'm all uh, in favor of this, and I hope we can expand it to 750. Thank you. Thank you. Any other? Okay. Uh, Mayor O'Neill, members of the council, my name is Jim Mosier. Uh, first of all, as I understand it, this has something to do with expanding non-conforming cottages. And we just heard about the accessory dwelling units. Is the staff telling us now that the ever-changing state rules about ADUs allow them to be added to non-conforming structures? if one of these cottages is non-conforming. Uh, second point is the reason we had the restrictions in the past that you're relaxing had to do with the concern about parking. I'm not sure the concern totally goes away, so I would suggest to you, as I did to the Planning Commission, I believe, if you're wanting to go to allowing the larger increase you might want that to be contingent on providing some parking of some kind if you're going to go to the 750 square feet. And then finally, I suggested some changes to the text of the ordinance. You are tonight introducing an ordinance. You want to get it right on the first reading. And looking at page 16-15, at the top is... Uh, saying that the ordinance applies to a residential dwelling, duplex, or triplex. I believe it was agreed at the Planning Commission that that was intended to say a single-family residential <coughs> dwelling, duplex, or triplex. The way it's worded now, it would seem to apply to any residential dwelling. So I think you need to make, of the many changes I suggested, at least that change needs to be made. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers on this item? All right, let's bring it back. Uh, so let's go with the uh, language question first and then the ADU question second. Mr. Harp. <laughs> we took a look at it today. We think it actually clarifies if, if by saying single unit residential dwelling. I think it probably reads a little bit better as opposed to uh, just saying residential dwelling. Uh, so we'd recommend that change everywhere that appears. Okay. In, in the text of the, of the uh, ordinance. Understood. All right, and then the, uh, to the, so the, so, the recommendation then is on page 16-15, there's an exception for cottage preservation. Uh, the final sentence says, are permitted for a residential dwelling, duplex or triplex that comply with the following criteria and the recommended changes are permitted for a single unit, single fa single family? Single family. Single family, yeah, thank you. That didn't, that didn't sound family. right, got it, single family. I, I think the single language unit. actually used it is single unit? zoning is single unit. Single, single unit. unit. Single unit, so we would, it, if someone were to make a motion, we would be incorporating the phrase single unit in front of the word dwelling where that appears. And there's a couple other little typos that uh, Jim brought to our attention. The uh, wrong resolutions referenced in the resolution, and um, I think it says authoring, <laughs> authoring instead of authorizing in one okay. point. So we'll need to make those, those modifications as well. Okay, and then to the question about um, adding ADUs to nonconforming, what's the... What's the thought on that one? Yeah, so it is a possibility. Um, the law makes it very easy for someone to convert existing space within an existing building, whether it's conforming or non-conforming. And that would be true whether we pass this or not. That's correct. Yeah, okay. All right, um, any discussion up here? Mr. Muldoon. Yeah, if they're gonna convert it, like like to look nicer, right? And have it be a cottage style than a cement block. Um, could you just go back to that language and could you put it up on the screen? Because Councilwoman Dixon and I were just discussing that. I want to be sure the distinction you mentioned about single unit. Let's see. So we'd need to pull up. Um, we need to get. Uh, do we have a copy of? Does do someone have a copy of the language? We can just. We actually it? have this on the screen right now. Is that oh. is that the appropriate one? Perfect. Yep, that's it. Okay. okay, and just walk just so that we fully understand it. Walk us through it. I mean, what you do. So this is an exception to another provision in the non-conforming chapter that limits uh, additions to non-conforming structures that are non-conforming due to parking to a 10% uh, addition. So this is, an, 
this is going to be an exception to that other provision, which would allow additions up to 50% of the existing floor area of that structure, uh, but no greater than 500 square feet, which is the cap we discussed. Uh, and then the clarification is to add single unit residential dwelling, uh, and then it goes on to say duplex, triplex, and then there's a, another clarification I'd like to make. It says when they comply with the following criteria, and then the criteria is in the, the ordinance, and that sets forth the building envelope that they'll need to comply with. Okay, that's what I was confused. You're putting single unit just to be specific, offer just, clarity. Just for clarity, okay. just to confirm that it's, it's not a, a residential unit within a larger project. Perfect, thank you. Okay, thank you. Ms., I'm sorry, did you wanna speak? No, okay. Um, all right, well, uh, if I recall correctly, this, uh, this came from Councilmember Herdman. Would you like to make the motion? I'll I'll, I will move to approve uh, with the amended language uh, referencing single unit residential uh, dwelling. Do we have a second? It, and is that, does that include to increase from 500 to 750? Oh, that's a, no. That's, no. no. Okay, no. all right. Second. Do we have a second? All right, second from Councilmember Brenner. Uh, do we have any discussion on this, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Muldoon? Yes, I'd like to offer a substitute motion to amend this to be up to 750. Really, I think we're on the same page, Jeb. It's just to sure. encourage people to keep the cottage, sure. even though they're losing square footage. That's fine with me. Okay, hang on just a moment. What we'll do then instead is, is it okay if that's offered as a friendly amendment then? Yes. And do you accept that? Is that acceptable? Yes. Okay. All right, any discussion? And just briefly, your motion includes the other two changes that I reference that's as well? Correct. Yes, yes, it does. Okay. Uh, any discussion on this? All right, let's vote. Prior to reading the vote, I'll read the ordinance title for ordinance number 2020-4, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach, adopting code amendment number CA 2019-006 to amend title 15, entitled Building and Construction, and title 20, entitled Planning and Zoning of the Newport Beach Municipal Code related to cottage preservation. The motion carries unanimously, 7-0. All right, um, we will move into current business item number 17, Mr. Duffield. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, before I recuse myself, I <clears throat> don't want to go out of here without, I've completely forgot to thank our staff, <clears throat> Dave Webb and Chris Miller for all their great work on this dredging project that I take credit for, which I should not because they do all the, the hard work. <clears throat> but. Um, on this item, I'm going to have to recuse myself for uh, business interests. Thank you. All right, thank you. We'll just wait a moment. <coughs> All right, uh, before we uh, jump to staff, we'll um, actually, I'd like to invite uh, Skip Kenny to come up and speak first. and. Uh, also, we'll, you'll probably get thanked a lot, but I just want to say, especially the subcommittee from the Harbor Commission that uh, worked this through, thank you. Um, the amount of uh, effort and public, uh, the, the amount of effort that went into this, in addition to all of the time that you spent in public meetings is Herculean, so I just want to say, before you even start, thank you. So anyway, Mr. Kenny, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Honorable Mayor Mem uh, O'Neill, uh, Mayor O'Neill and members of the City Council. I am joined tonight by Harbor Commission Chairman Paul Blank and Commissioner Don Young, and I'd like for them to come up and join me if they would. Uh, we are the three Harbor Commissioners that were the ad hoc committee tasked with reviewing Title 17 of the City of Newport Beach Municipal Code, providing the Harbor Commission with the committee's recommendation, recommended modifications and updates, taking into account the current users and usage of the harbor and the responsibilities of the newly formed Harbor Department in presenting those modifications and updates approved by the Harbor Commission to you this evening for your review. We do apologize for the length of time that it took us to bring this to you. Uh, we did have to review 100 plus pages of city municipal code. Uh, in all, there were approximately 25 meetings, six of which were public stakeholders meeting and two of those were in front of the entire Harbor Commission. Uh, there were numerous reviews of drafts of the entire code, 
input received from the public on a portion of the city's website that was created specifically for comments to Title 17, significant email and conference call exchanges necessary to get us to this point, and in many cases a change to one part of the code necessitated changes to many other parts of the code. And so we're pleased to present to you this evening the Harbor Commission's recommended modifications and updates to Title 17 of the City of Newport Beach Municipal Code exclusive of section 1710 which deals with marine activities permits and we hope to be back to you very shortly with our recommendations on that section staff in their report to you will discuss the key modifications <coughs> and updates to the code that the harbor commission is proposing this evening but before i turn it over to them i would like to thank assistant city manager carol jacobs harbor master kurt borsting and Assistant City Attorney Yolanda Summerhill for all of their support that they provided to us and for their dedication to our collective goal of getting Title 17 right. In my opinion, we're fortunate to have such knowledgeable and dedicated individuals to work with, and we would like to thank them for all of their efforts and for their patience in dealing with this complex task. Kurt? Uh, thank you very much, Commissioner and uh, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. I'm going to present a summary of the work that the Commissioners led us through. Um, <coughs> uh, as you all are aware, in 2018, this ad hoc committee was formed, and uh, their goal was to do a cover-to-cover -cover review of all of these code sections. As uh, Commissioner Kenny mentioned, public participation was paramount in this effort. Six meetings were held between April and August of 19, in depth in nature. They were, uh, the website that was created was already mentioned, and beyond just promoting the dates, it allowed people to uh, view uh, red line drafts, submit online written comments if they were unable to attend in person, and those materials, this photo represents the type of uh, public participation we saw, groups ranging from 30 to 50 people at these various public meetings, so we had a good level of stakeholder buy-in. This slide is, is uh, intended to try to demonstrate uh, how this was a lot of content to take on. And so the strategy that the commission took was to break it into three review blocks. The first public meeting would collect feedback, written comment from those wor that were unable to attend would be uh, incorporated into drafts, and then a second draft would then go back to the public for additional review and revision. And that happened over and over again with the three various blocks. Then on to the uh, ad hoc committee a second time, the Harbor Commission, the folks with the city attorney's office, and that brings us to the work we're doing tonight. This slide represents the three blocks and the various sections of the code that were covered in each of those blocks. And some of the key topics that were focuses of the Title 17 review included uh, clarifying public hearing processes, improving rules associated with popular public dock use, looking at the live aboard uh, boater experience, commercial marina requirements, allowable overnight stays for non uh, live aboard boaters, and Harbor water quality, I'm not reading each of the bullet points, but just touching on some of them here, and harbor water quality issues was very, very central to this review. In the various provisions, updates to the duties of various staff are recommended in 17.05, including a review of public hearing requirements. In the case of 1725, Recommendations to provide my office some additional tools in the event sea lions board people's boats if we can't reach the boat owner. This way our team can act more quickly and hopefully protect property and the quiet enjoyment of uh, neighboring uh, residents. See the sea lions bark real loud at night. Um, in the, in the uh, case of harbor development, proposed updates for public notice requirements so that neighbors know when planned uh, Developments are planned and clarifications on abutting properties when uh, encroachment is in play. And in terms of the live aboard community, one recommendation coming from the commission is to set commercial marinas at 7% of their slips for live aboards. This was a, intended as a clarification in that the prior version 
of 17 could have been uh, um, interpreted that no liveaboards would have been permitted in those, um, in those settings. We also view living in the harbor, uh, <coughs> not only is it a benefit to the community as a, as a um, neighborhood watch style model, but it's also a really neat way to have a lifestyle. And so you have to be a community member in good standing. You, can't, you have to have your bills paid and the mooring equipment serviced and not have a history of incidents. The emphasis on water quality is shown here where the liveaboard uh, community currently have what I would consider a, a, a uh, what's the word for it, an honor system in terms of reporting um, their um, servicing of the, the head or the restroom facilities. And the commission felt strongly that moving to a more accountable system by either use of a commercial pump out service or another uh, accountable system that could be worked out with my office was important periodically being able to do dye tab testing to again make sure those heads are safe and not spilling um, pollutants into the harbor. In the case of overnight stays for non-liveaboard boaters, those are just our recreational boaters in the, um, in the fields, there was a lot of discussion about what the, what the magic number would be. And some, uh, there was some consideration of making it more overnight stays in a month than is currently the case. There were other members of stakeholder groups that frankly thought it should be eliminated altogether. And following a lot of healthy discussion, the commission's recommendation was that there should be no change, that the three nights a month standard that's currently in the code should remain. Guest boaters that are using the harbor on a short-term stay, um, will con are re the recommendation is that they continue to be granted up to 15 nights in a 12-month period for overnight stays. But that recommendation would also allow some latitude for my office in those ca cases if we were to have, you know, uh, some, some visitor who needs 18 or 19 days, we could consider that on a case-by-case -case basis to some little limited extent. In the case of uh, 1760, um, I'm going to re restate uh, water quality over and over again, but this would also allow additional tools to let the city conduct dye tab testing on vessels um, <coughs> within the mooring fields, similar to a model that is in place currently in Avalon. Um, it clarifies the rules associated with loaning of moorings and establishes a methodology for those folks that I'll say have their dream boat in mind, but maybe their current mooring doesn't allow for the size of the boat and they come and request an extension. To speak to that just a little bit in greater details, the, the map that's shown here on this slide represents the various mooring fields in Newport Harbor. And these are defined fields, and so when someone asks for a larger space to store their boat, it can have an impact on neighboring vessels and could potentially congest those fields uh, for people that need to navigate the, um, their, way, their way to their mooring. In, in a, uh, so, this will be coming back in a policy form in, in, later de in greater detail in February, but the principle behind this is uh, to allow a more easy to understand system for folks that make these requests and allow the harbor master to um, consider such requests up to five feet provided that they meet the criteria established and approved. Those requests beyond five feet would need to go to the full harbor commission for their consideration. And the recommendations that are being put forward also guard against they, it's really intended for that, that dream boat that I was discussing. It's not intended as a speculative device for somebody that um, may perceive the, value, the, the mooring having greater value at a, at, a, at, a, at a greater size. And so there's some provisions to guard against that per, p potential. Um, water quality, water quality, water quality. The proposal allows for city to, the city to, um, to place a die tab in a, in a vessel that's visiting the harbor for a short time. And we would visit that vessel and ask to go aboard. And of course, if the owner of the vessel says no, they have their property rights and their Fourth, Am their fourth Amendment rights, but they, they would be asked to leave the harbor because they, you don't, you, um, uh, just a, sorry, just a moment, Mr. Muldoon. I have something, something somewhat comical and something serious. Yes. My favorite movie is one of them is called Tombstone. It's about Wyatt Earp and the Cowboys. And the, and the Cowboys deputize themselves. They, they give themselves stars. You'll notice our harbor commissioners have star lapels. Looks like they're the law on the water. And so right now it's the Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday versus the, the Cowboys. Um, but thanks for all your hard work on this. And I want just people to know that if they see some of the star, thank them for all the hard work they've done on the harbor. 
when someone, in, this, in the case of um, Avalon, when a die tab request is submitted, someone goes aboard and, and places it in, um, is there an argument that it's a consent in order to use the mooring, or how do they justify going on board in consideration of Fourth Amendment? Yeah. Well, we would request, as they do on the island, we would <coughs> request permission to board the boat, to deposit the die tab, and inspect the sanitation systems. If the um, vessel owner denies that request, we would respect that request, but we would also advise them that that's a requirement to rent the mooring, and so we would wish them well as they sail on. And, and that's because um, you say, get out of the okay corral, right? But uh, no, that's a tombstone joke, but uh, that's because it's public use of publicly controlled land, and you have the right to revoke their ability to use it if they don't comply with a request. That's correct. As opposed to someone having real property in their effects or their, their home. That's okay, correct. excellent, thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> and as we, um, and lastly, the commission has made, has made recommendations for um, the processes of appeals in the event one of the staff uh, decisions was to, uh, you know, if the party thinks we got it wrong, um, that they have a uh, due process um, established through the code. Um, the same is the case in the event an act of the commission is uh, viewed as uh, having gotten it wrong, and it clarifies that those uh, uh, appeals should go to the Harbor Commission or the City Council, respectively. Thank you for your time this evening. Go ahead, Mr. Kenny. We are here, the three of us, just to respond to any questions or comments that you may have. Um, this is much too much for one person to know it all, and we all have uh, a lot of uh, time and, and, and effort into this, and what one forgets, the other one hopefully will remember. So we're just here to answer questions. Thank you. All right, Mr. Avery. Thank you, and uh, congratulations and for uh, a great job and seeing something to its uh, its completion. And this is a huge moment for the harbor, where this is really where the city takes back takes back the harbor, um, and uh, we finally can uh, uh, exert some authority our harbor department, which it didn't really have before, to um, protect the waterways and uh, make the harbor safe and fun for everyone. So uh, it's a, and it was a hell of a lot of work and I appreciate it from all three of you. I know the whole entire council does, so it's, it's great because none of it was, none of it was easy. Um, I have just a question about, um, I, I, I tend to think that we could allow more liveaboarders in marinas. And, and I also understand that most marinas in Newport Beach don't allow it. And of course, that's their prerogative. So the Bay Club doesn't allow it. I don't believe the Irvine Company doesn't allow it. And that takes out some of the big dogs. Um, and I'm not sure about the rest. But there's some smaller marinas. And uh, my experience, I mean, being at least temporarily in marinas with liveaboarders, liveaboarders are as was mentioned, um, they are like neighbors in the sense that they watch out for the, their neighborhood. And uh, so there's an awful lot of time when marinas aren't policed or the harbor staff is not there at night. And, uh, usually they run with a pretty lean staff. So you always, and I'm sure um, uh, Harbor Master Kurt knows that uh, you go out in the mooring fields and you talk to the people that are living aboard their boats, they know what's going on. and. Uh, they may not always give you the straight scoop, but if you go to two or three of them, you'll get a sense of it right off the bat. <laughs> and uh, so I think they, they can also bring the same um, to a small marina run by a, maybe an independent operator that doesn't have a lot of, of uh, resources. So um, I'm just curious about the 7% and um, it, would there be a, is it, how, how did that come about? And then could we think, uh, would, would it be detrimental to increase that, to allow them to have more than maybe one boat or no boats, depending on the size of their marina? Uh, yeah, Council Member Avery, let, let us address that, and I think all three of us might want to have a, a, you know, a shot at that. Um, when we looked at Title 17, it did not address uh, commercial marinas. Right. 
And there were two schools of thought. I think you could interpret that to mean that liveaboards were prohibited. I also think you could interpret that to mean that there was no limit. I think the potential risk of having a commercial marina occupied solely by families living in their boats could exacerbate traffic, city services, and certainly water quality. And so we felt that we needed to um, put a limit on commercial marinas. However, there was no trigonometric function to come up with the 7%. We used 7% merely because that was the number that was limited on the offshore moorings, and so we felt that was, um, that was probably the right number. But I think we're, we're all open, and I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues. Uh, if the council believes that that number should be higher or lower, um, right, so be it. I would just say that the 7% number was selected because that is the traditional number for moorings. So we selected that number for um, commercial marinas. Uh, the number in LA, the, excuse me, the number in the city of LA is 10% in both situations. And I believe we referenced and grilled Kurt um, carefully on his experience, his prior experience, and that was the number that he brought. So 10% was the number in your previous marina, is that correct? City of Long Beach, I, they actually had a lower number. It was five percent liveaboard, uh, but it's a it's a very large uh, <laughs> series of marina, thirty two hundred slips in, in between the two two marinas. So they have a large population still. Great. Uh, just going back to the we're using that same formula for the offshores. Um, the each of the marina operators will be more centralized owners uh, operating. You know, groups of these facilities versus single um, uh, operators that are at least uh, on the mooring fields. So we believe that having that percentage is just as we had described earlier is somewhat consistent. Mm -hmm. And since there are many mooring oper um, uh, marine operators since like Irvine Company and such that have zero level boards, we felt that having at least seven stated in the code instead of being remaining unstated would be consistent with the other rules. So a small marina, there's a couple of small marinas in town with maybe 25, 30 slips. So it's 7%. I'm a journalism major. <laughs> How many slips would there be? Three. Thank you. And uh, um, that, so I'm just wondering if that would be um, detrimental to have, say, five out of those slips. And so I think probably the only real issue is, yeah, would they be impacting water quality? And I suppose you could go to something like, we're assuming that they're playing by the rules in terms of the holding tanks and all that, but there's probably a gray water issue, what goes down the sink, and then that's an education thing in terms of types of soap to use and you know, watching what goes down your sink and that kind of thing. Question so. for staff. Um, <clears throat> I believe we addressed it, but I would want to make sure that the liveaboard in the commercial marina would also need a liveaboard permit. Of course. And, yeah, and that yeah. then helps us control uh, the use of that vessel as a, uh, as a domicile. Right. Right. Um, great. Thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, Ms. Brenner. I would just like to say thank you. The amount of work that has obviously gone into this is extraordinary, and I especially appreciate the fact that you also reached out to the community, but you addressed the, the weeds, the nuts and bolts issues that we at this level would really never have been able to handle because this is your area, it's your expertise, and I just value that so much. And for that reason, I'd really like to, I, I will support this as is because I would rather not adjust it here unless we have a really compelling reason to do so. And one of the points I would like to make about this is that I think tonight is a prime example of why I have been advocating for a commission that addresses traffic in our city. We spent what, two hours in our study session on the weeds and nuts and bolts of the Newport Heights traffic issue, and it has been to this council numerous times. We've had no board or commission like this with really qualified people who 
who are not political. They can vote their conscience, and they um, and they obviously care about what they're doing. And so, when they bring something to us, we don't have to go through that tedious um, the tedious effect of having to look at every single proposal that staff has brought to us. So I think it's it's just remarkable the the contrast that we see tonight between this and what we deal with continuously over and over and over again when it comes to traffic. I wish that every major issue that we had in the city was handled by a commission that was going to look at it with as much diligence as these people have done. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Dixon. Uh, thank you. We're all going to uh, be pronouncing our gratitude and, and appreciation for the hard work of the Harbor Commission. So I will echo Councilmember Brenner's and well, everyone's comments because it is stupendous what you <laughs> have really done. Um, I do want to address the commercial marina on this one area. I don't, we can further discuss whether we deal with it tonight or since the uh, uh, MAPs are going back to the Harbor Commission, maybe it could be folded into that. But having just, as I mentioned earlier, having spent a day and a half in Sacramento, a large part of the discussion related to housing, I want to be sure we're not foreclosing the city's opportunities to look at, potentially look at liveaboards as a form of affordable housing or any form of housing since we have to find ways to get to that 4,800 Number. So I would ask if we uh, could consider uh, or recommend uh, and when the Harbor Commission is discussing the marine activities permit matter, that part of the section of the code, that they look at the commercial marina aspect to, to make sure that we get the right number, not just because mooring, there are different moorings and commercial marinas, they're apples and oranges, uh, that we look at it with the sense of what's practical and do we want to encourage and not discourage liverboards for that purpose so that would be if we are making a motion at some point to adopt the recommendation of staff I would also want to refer to the Harbor Commission these two additional uh, updates that some marine activity permit uh, permit work which is on, going to be ongoing and to look at the commercial marinas as a potential yes or no as to whether they are incorporated in our housing requirements it could be. I mean, that's a potential opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, that may end up needing to be a uh, a letter from us to HCD also. That was a, it might be what? It might it might need to be a letter from us asking the question to HCD also. Yeah. Anyway, all right, Mr. Avery. I'm. You know what? Actually, I'm sorry. I'm going to make sure that council members get a first first chance. Mr. Herdman first. Welcome back. Bill, Don, and Paul. I know each of you personally. Uh, I greatly respect each of you, your work ethic, uh, your expertise, your integrity, and the in entire year you put in on this project. Uh, I have absolutely no problem at all supporting your recommendations, and I want to thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Avery. <clears throat> yeah, I would support um, um, Council Member Dixon's proposal to... Um, to uh, have the Harbor Commission take another look at it and bring it back with the map in a few months. And uh, I'd just like to say that um, given that because the, the largest blocks of slips have prohibit living aboard, there aren't many opportunities as Harbor to do so in a marina where there's heads and showers and facilities. Because it is a certain lifestyle. And if you love, love boats, and uh, there's a lot of people that would prefer to live on a boat than in a house. Um, I think we should give them that opportunity and let the, I mean, I think ideally you let the marina sort of figure out what their, what amount they would like to have as liverboards and um, obviously we maybe we put a cap on it, but uh, certainly more than I think what the 7% is, but I would leave that up to maybe the harbor, we, there's, it's so, the number of small marinas is so small, it'd just be interesting to conduct and maybe you've already done it, um, just a survey of the setup, does it have the facilities to handle the borders, the heads and the showers? Not that they need, they've got self-contained on their boats, but a lot of times they'd like to use those shoreside amenities. And then um, just see what it would mean, because I think you'd come up with a number pretty quick of the max number, something that's sort of reasonable and work with each business owner that has a marina. 
to do that. And I think it would add a little bit more to the fabric of the marina and the, I think uh, the oversight of the marina. I think the, those marina operators would choose their tenants carefully. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, if I, if I can, uh, uh, Harbor Master Borsting did conduct uh, a fairly simple survey of most of the marinas. And so we have that data. And, um, you know, at the pleasure of the council, we certainly could take a look at the percentage when we finalize our work on the marine activities permits. We do plan on having another public hearing on that particular issue. And so, you know, again, at the pleasure of the council, we could certainly wrap uh, that percentage issue into that public hearing also. Okay. Ms. Brenner. Mr. Mayor, did you say that you talked to city staff about our arena numbers as it would pertain to live aboards and got some clarification if we move forward on that? No, no, sorry. What I was, what I was saying was um, in order for us to find out whether live aboards would count, uh, we would need to send in a, a request into HCD to find out. It's similar to what we're going to need to do with ADUs. And I would just caution that um, if the answer comes back, yes, it may end up triggering an SB 330 issue on uh, live aboards. So that will end up being a dual double edged sword. Okay. So, but I just want to point that out that um, as we, uh, as we're trying to determine whether little boards could count, we would just need to send in a clarification request and we will have lots of those. So that's, that's the We thought. don't want to do anything that would impact any of that. That's yeah, <coughs> that is, that is, that is essentially correct. Yes. Yep. Um, so before we go out to public comment, just to clarify real quickly, Mr. Avery was saying that he agreed with Ms. Dixon, and your point, if I understood it correctly, was you're fine with as is, but you'd like the Harbor Commission to take another look at the percentage issue as, along with the uh, MAP discussion. Uh, yes, that, but as you're saying that, I'm thinking, uh, is it possible just to pull that out so it's not, it doesn't go into effect? Or is it in effect or with this qualification that we uh, recommend that the Harbor Commission review it before they set that limit? Well, let's, so let's go to, that's a good question for Mr. Harp. So Mr. Harp, the question I suppose is, can we pull out the the 7% issue, or I guess maybe that's As a question for Ms. Summerhill. As it applies to Summer the commercial marinas. Well, uh, like they said, there's no standard currently you know, as far as, as allowing it, and there are people living in the uh, commercial marina. So my recommendation is we leave it at 7%, let them go back and take another look at it, see if they got the right number. Um, <laughs> but there is a, a situation existing today that n probably needs to be taken care of and is not easily taken out because there's so many revisions to the chapter on liveaboards. Our recommendation would be go ahead and uh, go forward with it and then uh, have them take another look at it and maybe modify it. All right, they're not that many, it's just two. Related because it was looks like to me it looked like commercial marinas were just tacked on into the uh, largely related to moorings and then they added in the commercial marinas. So you're talking about just pulling out that one little piece of and what would you propose? You would just leave just it leave blank. it silent, just as a, the current code is, and then but we in our in our actions tonight direct the Harbor Commission to come back with a recommendation. I, I think you could do. I think you could do that if you're just going to eliminate basically the one sentence that yes. authorizes it and leave it blank. Yeah, that's what I would recommend. What would be the effect of, right. of doing that? Well, it creates an odd situation because you do have people that are living in the marinas, and, and so um, it's so, somewhat been implied that that, that was permissible, so it would be just an issue that's not addressed, it's silent on it. Which it has been for decades, correct? M May yeah, May Mayor, Mayor O'Neill, we have, um, I have a copy of our um, kind of informal survey that we do with marinas. At 7%, we have, um, we have three live aboards that we um, surveyed in Newport M Harbor Marina. Every everyone else has zero or one. So even if you put the 7% in, there's, I, I can't believe we're impacting anybody. So we can do it either, we can do it at the council's pleasure either way, but there are, we do not believe that there are so many that we would be um, telling somebody that they had to kick out their liver boards. May I just make a comment? Oh, yeah, of course. Um, but I could say it the other way as well. I mean, there's so few. Why even putting a limit on it? <laughs> yeah, right. yeah um, Honorable Council Member Dixon, if I can address that. Our concern was that we could end up with marinas full of liver boards if there is no limit, 
and that could have a very significant effect on traffic and city services and certainly on potential environmental effects with the uh, water quality. I, well, I respect that and appreciate that. You gentlemen are the experts. Uh, it just surprises me and when, when Newport Beach is being accused of not having enough affordable housing, we have opportunities to be living on your boat and nobody's taking advantage of that and so there are only a handful of liverboards. I just wonder if we're trying to solve a problem that, that doesn't exist. I'm happy to refer it back to the Harbor Commission so they can address this in consideration of these comments this evening. Just what is the real issue? If there's not a problem after decades of not regulating liverboards on commercial marinas, what's driving this change? But if there is a, a need to, I certainly respect the Harbor Commission greatly and would appreciate them coming back with additional thoughts to inform us on, please. All right, Mr. Avery. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I don't want to go any further on this. I, I would just like to make sure whatever is going on right now that we, liver boards are secure in where they are right now, whatever we do, and that the commission comes back with a recommendation. Okay, Mr. Herdman. Quick question, Bill, did, did the RENA numbers and affordable housing enter, enter into your recommendation for this 7% at all? No, sir, it did not. That wasn't in your thinking. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, we're going to go out to public comment now. So public comments on this item. Uh, Mayor O'Neill, members of the council, my name is Jim Mosier. Uh, First of all, I would like to acknowledge that I, I, I believe this was a sincerely well-intentioned process. It was very thorough. Uh, the commission did as best they could, but no process is perfect. And one of the problems at the public meetings was there was a tendency to focus on little details that the subcommittee had noticed with the code. And it was really difficult to try to move the conversation to a bigger picture view of how the Harbor Code might need to be revised. And the Harbor Code itself has some big picture structural issues to it. If you look at your agenda packet, page 12, you will see the table of contents of the Harbor Code. You'll see that there is a chapter on vessel launching and operation. There's a chapter on berthing, mooring, and storage, which all sound like harbor uses. And then that's followed by a charbor chapter called Harbor Use Regulations. This is not user-friendly when you have things that sound like they should belong on one chapter, and then you have another chapter that seems to include everything. Similarly, you'll see a chapter on marine activities permits. You'll see a chapter on harbor development permits. You'll see a chapter on dredging permits. And then that's followed by a chapter on harbor permits. So this is not a user-friendly code. Uh, one thinking that they want a permit is, I, I mean, the staff understands it, presumably. The Harbor Commission maybe understands it, but the average person reading it wouldn't know where to look for a particular permit in here. So it, it has those problems. And when I could mention where it says Harbor Use Regulations, even that is not comprehensive. It doesn't give you the regulations on swimming in the harbor, which are on a totally different part of the code. Uh, as to the Har Harbor Code and the housing issue that you're asking, the council may be interested to know a prior version of the Harbor Code actually anticipated the possibility that Newport Harbor would develop a Sausalito-style houseboat area in the harbor. Houseboat being different than a liveaboard, houseboat is actually a, designed as a home. <coughs> it's connected to the city sewer system and utilities and so forth. Uh, that chapter disappeared somewhere in the 2008 comprehensive uh, update. Uh, late this afternoon, I submitted some comments that I sent to the city staff after the Harbor Commission reviewed this. So the subcommittee here, I don't think, has seen these. Uh, I partly gave it to you because it had a little narrative in it and how the Harbor Code got so unuser friendly as it currently is, and comments like I do on the details of it. And since you're just tonight introducing the ordinance, 
Should anybody be interested, you can look at those comments in the two weeks before you introduce the thing. As just an example, I can go over it just a second here. If you look at page 732 of your agenda packet, you'll see the provision, section 1705030, about what the code applies to. And you'll notice I made a comment about that. And after the Harbor Commission saw that, the staff tried to correct that. Try reading that yourself and see if you understand what the Harbor Code applies to. It seems to bite itself in the tail and makes no sense at all to me now, but probably nobody reads that. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening. Uh, Mayor O'Neill and council members. My name Sorry. is Jim Parker and I uh, need you a little closer to the mic. I, I need you a little closer to the mic. Yep, thank you. Okay, good evening. Uh, I'm, uh, my name is Jim Parker and I'm uh, representing Port Calypso Marina. And I had some prepared comments, but uh, after the dis dis recent discussions you, you, you have had, I'd just like to say that, first of all, I'd like to thank um, uh, council members Avery and, and Dixon for the comments that they have made. I think they're right on point. I, I support the idea of, of bringing the, uh, the liveaboard uh, matter uh, for commercial marinas back to the Harbor Commission so that we can, and, and so that they can take another look at it. And <coughs> I, was, I was out of the country during the previous meetings and I will be there at any future meetings to, to uh, give my, my input to it. Uh, at Port Calypso Marina, I've, uh, I've had that, uh, this experience with liveaboards since 1980, uh, when I when I took over the operation in, in 1980, there were one or two. I don't remember for sure how many, but there weren't more than two. I've had one or two during the the, the intervening 40 years. At the t at this time, I'm I'm really the only city marina in Newport Harbor that has li live that that has liveaboards, and I have one. Uh, there's no proliferation. Uh, issue here. The, the marina is never going to be to, going to 100 percent. The, the the marina wouldn't no any marina. I would never want 100 percent. But but what I have is a small number, and I like to keep a small number, uh, uh, to because of the security and because of the ex, you know, the the extra eyes and uh, you know on the marina and on, on problems that might it might develop in the marina. So, and some of these, some of the marinas we're talking about, Harbor Marina and so on and so, so forth, they're, uh, in fact, most of the marinas on, on the, uh, four of the marinas on the survey that was made on, in May by, by uh, the Harbor Master, they're, har they're county marinas, and I don't believe they're even under, uh, uh, governed under Title 17. So, so you really take those out, of, you take those out of the mix, you take the county marinas out of the mix, and there's probably one marina, Port Calypso, that has, that has liveaboards, and I have one. So it's not a major issue, uh, and, I, and I, I realize that, that uh, it's hard to make dra uh, total changes at this, at this late date, but uh, if we can take it back, to, if we can s maintain the status quo, and then take it back to the Harbor Commission for study, bring, then bring it back to the council. I, re, I very much support that, and I think that's a great idea. Thank you for your, your, your interest and time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. All right, seeing none, we'll bring it back. Um, so to be consistent with, uh, I'm not gonna make the motion, but I just wanna make sure we're clear on what we need to do here. Um, in order to be consistent with um, <coughs> Councilmember Dixon's uh, comments. How would the motion be phrased, Mr. Harp? Probably the best way to do it is to move staff recommendation, except for Section 17-40110, uh, to delete the second sentence. Is there other references? Or on uh, all references, I guess, to uh, liveaboard permits at commercial marinas. I guess there's another reference in 17-40050C and 17-40. 40030. So it would be to omit code section references to what exactly? Uh, to commercial, to liveaboard permits in commercial marinas. Okay. All right. Uh, do we have a motion up here? Make a mo motion to what the city attorney just said. Second. <laughs> Seconded by Council Member Avery. Do we have any uh, discussion? All right. Seeing none, let's vote. 
we're, we're going to get the screen thing fixed. Prior to reading the vote, I'll read the ordinance title for ordinance number 2020-5, an ordinance of the City Council of City of Newport Beach, amending Title 17, the Harbor Code, and other related provisions of the Newport Beach Municipal Code, making comprehensive revisions, including but not limited to updating definitions, regulating marine sanitation devices to protect against discharge of waste in Newport Harbor, amending requirements for mooring sub-permits, adding a procedure to allow mooring length um, extensions, and modifying and or adding procedures for issuance of permits, appeals, calls for a review, and revocations. With Council Member Duffy recusing himself, the motion carries 6-0. All right, thank you. All right, we'll move to the next item, which is item number 18. Um, yes. I do have to recuse myself because of re real property interests on this item. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, staff report was pretty comprehensive. Do people feel the need to? I, I've got some questions, but do people have feel the need for a staff report on this? No, I have a few questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, Short staff presentation then, please. Real quick then, uh, Micah Martin's here, our deputy director. He'll go through a real brief short uh, presentation for you, background. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. Um, just a quick presentation here on our Balboa Island Wood Bench Maintenance Program. Um, just a brief, quick overview here. There's the, the, the benches we're talking about. There's Teak wood benches around the perimeter of the island, and then there's Jatoba benches, which are the two on the bottom there, which are exclusively on Marine Avenue. Along with the trash can in the center photo there, those are exclusive to Marine Avenue as well, and those are under <laughs> our maintenance program. Just a real quick history here, just how we, how we got to this point, how these benches came about. Um, the, the donation program introduced donation benches onto the island. That bench on the right is the concrete bench. Um, that was the, the original bench that was uh, recommended for the island because of um, it's concrete, it's easy to maintain and very durable. Um, after seeing the bench, the island raised some concerns. The BIIA got involved and um, proposed putting teak wood benches on the island because they were much more aesthetically pleasing, had a nautical theme to them, and it's more of what they wanted to see. So um, in 1996, PBR approved these uh, teak benches, <coughs> provided that the BIIA would agree to provide the maintenance of those. So as we move forward from that point on, uh, 2004, we brought on the Jotoba benches, again, through the BIIA, and um, them agreeing to take care of the maintenance of those as well. Um, in May of 2006, Council approved policy B-17, which basically did an umbrella coverage of all public benches that the city would then take care of maintenance of all public benches. So that then brought these benches under <coughs> our umbrella, and at that point on, we uh, inherited the maintenance of those benches moving forward. Um, 2012, so we maintained those benches in-house with in-house staff. At the time, we had our own working wood shop, we had carpenters on staff, and we were able to, to take care of the maintenance. In 2012, we eliminated that wood shop and downsized staff, and at that point, we had to uh, proceed with contracting these services out. And then over the years, um, the cost continued to increase and becoming more and more expensive. Um, but just in summary, here's a, a quick breakdown of the number of benches we're talking about, uh, which type there are, where they're located, and again, some pictures there. This is a breakdown of the bid proposal we received. Um, we went through a lot of effort to get proposals in, and uh, we ultimately had to do a public works bid, and we only received one bid, and this is, this is the bid we received, and so we had some concerns mm -hmm. with the cost. So um, that's why we brought that before you today. And then this uh, is just sorry, a, just a moment. Let's go back. Yeah. To the no, go ahead. Let him finish. Yes. Okay, never mind. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, and this is just cost of if we bought a new bench. This is the cost of uh, purchasing and installing new ones. So as opposed to having them refinished, just replacing them all with new ones. This, these are the type of costs we would be looking at for that. And at times we do have to replace them. Sometimes they get damaged beyond repair, and we do have to uh, buy a new one and replace it. <coughs> And that's not included in the contract. The contract is strictly for refinishing. Um, this is typical, you know, bench and trash can costs throughout the city. Those four benches there, or you may recognize those, those were previously approved on the B-17 policy change. Um, those are typical donation benches moving forward. 
So um, you can see those in comparison to what we have out there on the island. And then down below there, there's some examples of different trash cans as opposed to the Jatoba wood. So that gives you a brief uh, point of reference on cost-wise uh, for purchasing of benches. All these other benches in this photo here are, are much more maintenance friendly. They are much more durable, last a lot longer, require very little maintenance. So. Um, so our recommendation tonight is to um, possibly have the council approve the contract, award the contract. And what we'd like to do is maybe one more refinishing and then you know, buy us some time to further evaluate <coughs> if this is something we want to continue to do, if it's a sustainable model cost-wise, and if, uh, if there's other options we should be looking at. So with that, um, that ends my presentation. I answer any questions that you might have? We have a few. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's almost every council member. All right, Ms. Dixon. Okay, let me begin. So let me just, on Exhibit B on page 1824, just to see if I understand that chart correctly, um, I'm trying to understand the cost of re finishing, uh, repairing, maintaining a wooden bench what, per year. Is that, what, or every other year? How? What does it cost and how often are we doing it? On the, on the slide I have pulled up here, so. Cost Your mic on. Oh, I'm so sorry. This is the cost per bench on this slide here that I have. All right, 1150, um, is that it? Yes. And how often? This would be to do one refinishing per year. So we, okay, so just to. Just, that's for two. All right, up to two. Okay, but all right, that's fine. Let me just restate what the, the current policy was or initiated in that history you described. If my memory serves me correctly, when this $1,000 maintenance fee was added to the cost of the bench by the family or friends who were purchasing the bench, it was the $1,000 was considered for the life of the bench. Is that correct? Yeah, that's that's one that was, one thousand dollar payment. Yeah, there was a one thousand maintenance fee collected at the donate the time of donation to cover maintenance of the bench for its useful. And that's life. when the city had its own internal uh, shop to do that. So now we're right. talking about a hundred percent more plus is a thousand one hundred and fifty dollars, possibly annually or every eighteen months to refinish that same bench. So this is the situation we are finding ourselves in, that it multiply that times however many bunch of benches, 100 and... 109 benches. Nine, nine benches. Of, and now the matter before us tonight, just to be clear that I'm understanding this, is that you're looking for a budget authorization for $691,000 $691, to refinish and repair the 109 benches. Is that correct? Just a clarification on the um, council member Dixon. We received a bid and the $691,000 number you're referring to is for the total two year bid. And that has not only just um, refinishing benches, it has maintenance in there. It has twice a year versus our recommended one year cost in that. That's how the bid package was put together to fully cover that. Okay, well then let's say it's $345,000 for one year of refinishing 105 ben nine benches. So in, in your staff report on page 18.4, you'll notice we put a table in there, and that table refers to about um, $148,000 as our estimated cost just to refinish every bench and every uh, trash can for one year. Uh, that would be what we would suggest if you just did one more finishing that would be our exposed cost that doesn't include repairs uh, it wouldn't exercise every element of the bid well then I, why is the bid so expensive i mean i'm just dividing by two why yeah, is unfortunately again that also there's an allowance in there for repairs because a lot of the benches need certain elements the slats have to be replaced um, so staff has been historically doing that, so they added an element for the contract. All right, so f help me out here. So if I personally would to say I'd be comfortable with the $148,000 just for one year to just do the final, the final refinishing of these just to give you time to get new benches ordered under the new system. Is that what you're kind of looking at instead of half of the 691? Because you don't need to repair and rebuild the benches if we're shifting to a new model. Uh, th that'd be correct. If, if the decision is just to refinish them one more time, uh, I don't know what the new model would be, but it would cost roughly $148,000. All right, I just want to understand for my own purposes. Okay, I'll let others ask some questions. Thank you so much. Mr. Avery. Well, 
I'm reluctant to tread anywhere near Babel Island on these kinds of issues, just based on my recent experience up here. <laughs> but I'll dive in just a little bit. Um, not to get in the weeds, I think we just have to move to benches that don't need to be refinished, but we need to avoid, I believe, the, the ugly stuff. And there's some real ugly stuff, but there's some good benches, good materials out there today that look like wood, that pass, and I, I'm sure staff can come up with some great examples, and uh, I just think we need to move that direction, and I, I just question whether we need to have that many benches. I don't know what, but that's, that, those are my only two thoughts. I mean, see, and I, I would not spend another nickel on refinishing anything. That's my two cents. So just to just to be clear, these are the four benches that the Parks, Beach, and Rec have a lot of, um, adopted as the uh, the benches in Newport Beach. That's correct. City, correct. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Muldoon. Thank you. This slide is perfect. Right. Because it shows artificial wood, which looks fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. If we get some benches designed to look like similar to the teak we have now, let these ones slowly get weeded out or replaced with. Um, ones that will last a lot longer without fading, I think that's a better model. Because I, they're, they're beautiful, and if we had our own woodwork team, it makes sense, but we, this is not sustainable on a contract basis. So that would be my um, recommendation, is to let these ones phase out, find a replacement one for PB&R to sign off on, look similar, that the residents like, and um, <coughs> put it in the back bench. All right, Mr. Duffield. Uh, I, uh, <clears throat> I did a... Councilman Avery, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, I do too. But I'm going to start. I'm going to wade in a little bit farther. So, number one, um, do we really need 109 benches on Balboa Island? I mean, th there's a lot of double ups and blockage of walkways and things like that when you're when you're on there. I mean, we have 109 now, but do we realistically need 109 when we do if we were to do a replacement project? I would suggest we don't need that many. I remember some of the conversations when I first got the municipal operation group when there was a lot of need. People wanted to donate places. They were looking for places to put benches, and that's how I think you ended up with two at every street in. Carroll Beak Park has three or four, I think, in it. Um, I think and Marine Avenue is a whole different animal. Um, there are groups that think we need a lot of benches or other people think we should thin it out, and I'm not sure <coughs> who makes that decision. Yeah, so... Um so, I mean, you're looking at this and you think, okay, so even if we ended up at 100, you know, you at 2,900 per bench, um, it's a whole lot less than, you know, the, even the contract that we're, we're looking at right now. So it, it doesn't, I mean, from a cost perspective, it's not, a, it's not a close call. But I recognize that there are a lot of people who have plaques and they really care quite a bit about that, that particular bench. My suggestion would be that if we were going to start down the path of trying to find a way to replace and phase out, that we also have a um, plaque donation policy or a plaque of some kind where when uh, when the bench, yeah, we, we do have that, don't we? You know, actually, yeah, that's right. Yep, you're right. That's true. So we, so we adopted, yeah, no, so we had that, we did, yeah. That's right. So anyway, we, uh, we do need to make sure at least that families who would like to have the plaque back, that'd be great, especially as I'm looking at this. Can you go back a couple of slides, back to the cost slide? Yeah. I didn't even realize that we did new plaque purchase and installation. Um, I mean, I, that, the old plaque should be given to the families anyway. But anyway, so that's, um, I, uh, I would very much like to have the input of Bubble Island Improvement Association and whatnot as we go through this process, but I'm kind of I'm I'm with Brad on this one. I I don't I I mean I I don't think I think it seems fairly clear up here just from our incredulous questions that the um, that the cost of this has gotten so astronomical that the idea of maintaining these benches is unfeasible, and so we're probably going to need to get to the point where. We're doing a replacement project, and um, at that point, uh, we'd like to. We need to talk about placement. We need to talk about thinning out. We need to talk about um, which design. So, Ms. Brenner, I'd just like to clarify that we also are talking about replacing the old weathered um, trash cans, as well. Although I would like to say that even their old weathered trash cans are better than the plastic tubs that we have on Ocean Boulevard. 
that are so atrocious. <laughs> so, but we do need to look at something more sustainable in the trash cans. Okay. We Let would me like complain about there. Newport Coast for it. No, I'm just kidding. All right. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, Ms. Dixon. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, uh, not that we have to vote on these, but I do like the artificial wood, the infinity bench. I don't necessarily care for the others, but I guess I would like, since Parks, Beaches, and Recreation Commission is going to be taking this on next, is that what happens? To, will they make the selection based uh, on our action tonight? That could be your direction that they review this. Well, anyway, I would like to, uh, I, I'm sensitive to what Balboa has a special affinity for these wood slat benches and my suggestion would be to replicate that as closely as possible to what they currently have. And they're just as attractive and a lot costs a lot less to maintain. And they will last, what's the expectant life expectancy for the infinity bench? Uh, we typically expect about 10 years out of those. Yeah. So that would, anyway, that would be my uh, recommendation for, and that it's a good idea to get, certainly get Balboa Island people involved in this so everyone understands where we are. But I could just see the 691, that's almost $700,000. It's gonna be a million dollars in a couple of years. And we're gonna wish we <laughs> uh, dealt with this earlier. Okay, thank you. Uh, I mean, just for perspective, you can replace 51 benches with, um, 51 benches with the cost of that one year recommended on uh, page 18.4. All right, Mr. Avery. Um, I think obviously, it's a great idea and I can see how you come up with Teak's beautiful wood and you'd have a nice bench and a nice plaque on it, all of it. And <clears throat> it would work great if there was an adopt a bench program and somebody was really maintaining it. But we, of course we know that to have that done on a consistent basis to serve the public property properly, that would be very difficult to do with 109 benches. But um, having been around wood boats all my life, I have refinished things similar to these wood benches and I know exactly how many hours of labor goes into it? Because there's the top, the bottom, and the sides of all those slats. And to do it properly, you have to take them off. And it, it's, it's just, it's crazy, but it just, that's what it costs. And so it is totally unsustainable um, because of that. And it's, yeah, yeah definitely the environment, environmental side of it as well. So, yeah, but um, yeah, no doubt, a great idea. And certainly understand that the, uh, folks that wanted them, they're great, but like I, the infinity bench is a pretty good alternative, something similar to that. Okay, um, we'll go out to public comment on this. Mayor O'Neill, uh, city council members, I'm Susan Riddle. Um, I am very sorry, I didn't realize that the time was up to talk about Title 17. I thought they were still talking about the um, the live aboard. So I had a couple of questions uh, to you uh, on 1735.020F. Why are you eliminating not the notice provision? So I'm sorry, Ms. Riddle, that that item is done. And <laughs> so if if you'd like, we, we we will be bringing it back in in two weeks. But that item is that item is passed. Okay, so I can in two weeks I can talk. We have to bring it back for a second reading anyway. So yes, you absolutely can bring it back for uh, for public comments, and you can submit them to us directly as well for okay. our for our consideration. Okay, I'm sorry. I just I was I didn't realize. Thank you. Understood. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor, uh, Council Members, uh, Dennis Bress, Belbo Island. So yeah, seven hundred thousand. When I read in the Daily Pilot, it was like shocker. Um, yeah, so I think you guys are spot on. Um, it makes sense to move in the direction of having some community input uh, from the island, BIIA, BIPA, and the Balboa Island Merchants Association. So uh, as you know, we're really actively uh, working together in a collaborative way. So yeah, we can come up with uh, a plan and a design uh, based on plastic benches that uh, meet the community's requirements. Also in regards to doubling up at the end of the streets, yeah, I think, uh, you know, if each bench has a plaque on it, um, you know, it'd be up to the family if they want to keep it, or we could possibly even go to one bench and have two plaques on one bench. So uh, there's a way to accommodate on that. Um, I would also take a look at um, uh, the bid uh, process. Uh, I didn't know about it, um, and only one single bidder. Um, 
I know we're he not heading in the direction of doing the refurb at all, but if we did want to have some benches uh, extend some life on it for whatever reason, Costa Mesa has a pretty cool outfit called um, the Urban Workshop, and uh, it's a wood shop, metal shop, and I think they might be open, they're local too, to possibly uh, working with us. So uh, I could give you their contact details and see if they might be interested if in a short term we want to fix some benches to keep us going. But I think moving in the direction of uh, having a community consensus on what bench is adequate and then moving in that direction would be awesome. So thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening, uh, Council, uh, Mayor uh, O'Neill and Council. Uh, my name is Max Johnson, and I live in District 1 on the Balboa Peninsula. Um, on this topic, even though it's for Balboa Island, I wanted to ask um, Dave or staff if these considerations are also going to be made in District 1. I know on the Peninsula, Peninsula Point community specifically, we have uh, plastic cans in a lot of our beach entrances, and I think that... Um, I think these are the same cans that Joy was referencing to, that they're not very aesthetically pleasing. Um, and I would make the recommendation that whatever cans or bench that we choose for the island, we could potentially also consider for a peninsula. Um, and then another comment in addition to that, I know I uh, meant to message Diane about this, is staff or uh, s the city recently repaired some patches of uh, lawn at the Wedge Park. And so again, where a lot of benches in these, these plastic cans are, uh, there's a section right along the wedge jetty before you get out to the wedge tower that is completely destroyed. The concrete there is really hashed, and it's right near patches of lawn that the city just replaced. And I think it's a huge liability um, for the city, so that's something that I meant to, I took photos of that I can send Diane, but I think it's worth staff to look at to All potentially right, we're, repair. We're talking, we're talking about Balboa Island benches, so we're going to focus yeah. on that. So. In, in regard to this issue, if you can also consider um, our district and the CANs, the recommendations making for Babel Island, if they can also be considered for the peninsula, and then what that would look like, what um, council would have to vote on, or what Diane could propose. So, And I'm in favor of the artificial, so I do like the artificial option, and I think that uh, it's a lot more aesthetically pleasing than the plastic bins that we have lying around. So I know how many visitors we have down to my district in the beach, and I think uh, if we're putting those same trash cans in Babel Island, I think it'd be worthwhile to put in uh, Peninsula Point in the Peninsula. Thank you. All right, next speaker, please. All right, seeing none, we'll bring it back. Ms. Dixon. I just want to say to echo Council Member Brenner, I, I've been trying to get rid of, and Dave knows this, I've been trying to get rid of those blue trash cans for as long as I've been on the council. So maybe we can have a program for that. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Muldoon. I'll make a motion the staff withdraw this item at this time and come back with uh, a new proposal per our input. So per, hang on just one second. Just to clarify, um, per our input would mean sending it to uh, Park Speech and Recreation for a uh, recommendation on whether to, uh, what to do with the current benches and um, if, and potentially replace, have a replacement program. Is that my, because that's how I've understood the, the consensus, but I just want to make sure that I understood your motion. That's close enough, yeah. Okay, all right, and that's that's how you understood it on the second? Yep, that's fine. Okay, any discussion? All right, let's vote. With Council Member Herdman voting, or recusing himself, the motion carries 6-0. All right, Madam Clerk. A motion to reconsider the vote on any action taken by the City Council, either this meeting or the previous meeting, may be made only by one of the council members who voted with the prevailing side. All right, and uh, we will um, adjourn in memory of Stan Troutman. Uh, Ms. Brenner. Yes, I'd like to um, adjourn the meeting tonight in memory of Stanley Madison Troutman. I don't think the irony uh, will be lost on anyone of how we began the meeting tonight and ending the meeting in honor of Mr. Troutman, who was 102 years old. He was an um, world-renowned photographer. He started the photography department at UCLA. He was a World War II photographer. He, um, he had received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Press Photographers Association of Greater Los Angeles. He, is at, he was active in the community and in the church, which was the Newport Methodist Church in Corona del Mar. 
He is survived by three children, eight grandchildren, 19 great-grandchildren, and one great-great-grandchild. He was deeply loved by the members of the community who would often sit at Inspiration Point with him in the evening and watch the sunset. So he will be deeply missed. Thank you. We stand adjourned.